we're good to go, sir. All right. I, I also can't see you all as on here, but I do see Mr. Ridley Thomas, and I think I saw Mr. Oh, Mr. Core. Okay, so we got Core, and we're good. Okay, Mr. Villanueva, are we live? Yes, sir, we are. All right. Uh, good morning, and welcome to the virtual Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River Committee regular meeting. I apologize that we're starting eight minutes late, but I was having technical difficulties uh, in my office uh, getting logged on. Uh, so uh, please accept my apologies, public. I'm joined uh, by colleagues, um, council members, Mark Ridley-Thomas, Paul Kretz, uh, Kevin DeLone, and, and Paul Krikorian. But before I turn it over to our clerk to call the roll, I'd like to remind everyone to make sure they are on mute when not speaking. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, if you could please call the roll. Certainly, sir. Council member Micho Farrell. Present. Council member Mark Ridley-Thomas. Here. Council member Paul Kretz. Present. Council member Kevin De Leon. Here. Council member Paul Krikorian. Here. Everyone's present, sir, you have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva. Uh, because this meeting is going to run long, uh, it's a very dense uh, agenda with lots of important items to discuss. Uh, we will take 30 minutes uh, to hear public comment uh, specific to today's agenda items and one minute for general public comment. Our city attorney will now explain the speaking rules to the members of the public who are calling in and our city clerk will provide the necessary information for the public to dial in. And we have our city attorney ready to explain Yes, we can hear oh. you. Yeah, maybe just a little louder. Oh, sure. Can you hear me better now? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total, and one minute for general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. When speaking on agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief morning warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or again, stray off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time and we will move on to the next speaker. We will take up to 30 minutes total of public comment today. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you'd like to speak on. We know the situation is not ideal and thank you for your cooperation as we do the best we can. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Madam City Attorney. And uh, the clerk will now read the instructions uh, for the public to call in. Yes, sir. Uh, the audio for this meeting is broadcast live on the internet at https backslash backslash clerk, clerk, I'm sorry, dot lacd dot org uh, backslash calendar. The live audio can also be heard at 213-621-2489. Again, the number is 213-621-2489. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should dial 1-669-254-5252. Again, the number is 669-254-5252. And use meeting ID number 1609194. 5-9. Again, the meeting ID number is 160-919-4459, and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. When it is your turn to speak, an autom automated Zoom voice will ask you to press star 6 to unmute. 
Thank you, sir. We are now ready to take public comment. Let's get this going. Uh, please bring in the first caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello? We can hear you. Uh, uh, which uh, items would you like to speak on? And please uh, state your name. Awesome. Morning. My name is Francis. I'm an organizer of the Sierra Club's My Generation campaign. So I'll be giving general comment and comment on item number two. <clears throat> all right. One minute um, for each. Please go ahead. Awesome. So um, first of all, I want to just thank and applaud the committee's leadership for announcing uh, the two motions that accelerate our clean energy timeline with equity at its forefront. A transition to renewable energy isn't just when we get to 100, but just as much how we get there. So we strongly support the four amendments included in these two motions, a 2035 or earlier target, emissions reductions for frontline and EJ communities, and a report back from LADWP on our immediate no regrets actions. We're also very excited to see the new labor motion that includes strong workforce language with guaranteed competitive career pathways, prevailing wages, and project labor agreements, because we need to make sure that the green jobs of our future hire those that have been systemically harmed by the fossil fuels infrastructure of our past. And lastly, I just want to say we really can't afford to transition from one dirty fuel to another. LA has no place for biofuels or large-scale hydrogen. These fuels have diminishing emissions reductions compared to natural gas as 95% of hydrogen in the U.S. was refined from natural gas. And we really just need a clean break. Our collective futures depend on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Apologies. Hi there. Uh, my name is Tim Eames. Um, I'd like to speak on agenda item number two and general public comment. All right. You have one minute for each. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. So uh, I'm a resident of Echo Park, and uh, I'm calling this morning to congratulate and uh, thank the council members in this committee for their leadership on the strategic long-term long -term resource plan related to the LA 100 motions up for vote today. Um, so, as we know, climate change is already affecting Los Angeles with more frequent heat waves, and it's more important than ever to be setting these accelerated goals for the city's transition away from fossil fuel-powered energy and into a carbon-free future. So, 2035 is the target date we must strive for, and I thank you for taking the leadership in establishing this and setting LA up to be a great example for the rest of the country. Uh, moreover, we know this transition must be just and equitable, and I, as the previous caller mentioned, I'm happy to see them, uh, the motion today includes language that supports workforce development uh, via the creation of good paying green jobs that are going to help us build out this clean energy infrastructure. Uh, additionally, the communities living next to these, you know, soon to be phased out natural gas plants, these communities have to be prioritized in their local air quality. Uh, via the plant emissions, you know, staying at the same level or better levels in the coming decade. Um, in the future, I would like to see more talk and development of energy efficiency programs. I understand the LA100 study does take this into consideration, uh, but nonetheless, as we electrify our buildings and transportation sectors, uh, we're going to need to see an increased efficiency of these end-use appliances in order for the grid to continue to be stable and carbon-free. Uh, whether these programs are incentives or rebates for consumers, uh, we have to make sure the uh, efficiency of these products are accessible by everyone. As we, <coughs> excuse me, as the increased effic efficiency uh, will reduce the strain on the grid and reduce costs to the consumers using them. Uh, again, I thank, thank you, you for including the. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. This is Joanne D'Antonio, Community Forest Advisory Committee. The city, I'm, I'm speaking general public comment and item one. Okay, one the minute city for you. Thank you. The city biodiversity study is hugely important as it identifies Los Angeles as a hotspot that needs immediate attention. 
It is a tool that can be used to save our city from collapse. The motion that generated this, this study directs city departments to develop strategy to monitor, preserve, and enhance biodiversity in the city of Los Angeles. Today, we ironically have the first instance of this actually not happening. There is a new draft street tree planting list being introduced today at CFAC, and with it listed goals and philosophy behind the list that could have been written 10 years ago. Biodiversity is completely ignored, and it takes a very retro approach that assumes it does not have to consider the health needs of the city when we plant. There are very few native trees on the list and no plan to get nurseries to focus on providing us with these saplings. Last year, when we planted tree guarantee trees all over Victory Boulevard in CD2, UFD told me there was not one native tree sapling available and we had to plant exotics that will not help us out of our biodiversity predicament. Other cities are prioritizing biodiversity goals as a priority. Palo Alto put it in writing. Houston Galveston has a program to plant millions of native trees by 2030. It is financed by Shell Oil and supported by an administration that is listening to science because the survival of their area depends on it. We spent money on this study, and I support it wholeheartedly. Now it is up to you, our officials, to not allow our city departments to ignore this report. Insist that UFD and the city officer prioritize Thank and implement. Thank you so much, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Yes, my name is Jasmine Bargett. I would like to speak on items number two, general public comment, please. All right, one minute for each. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair O'Farrell and the rest of the committee for hearing this motion today and voting on it. I personally feel like it's a long time coming and really, uh, really grateful for your leadership on this. Um, we And you've heard from me in the past and our constituents that we're always See, we're hoping and calling for more ambitious climate action at this committee. And we want to reflect that this is what it looks like when community and council come together and you represent the needs and demands of the community, we get bold climate action. So I urge you to continue this by making sure that we are cons consistently working with community to listen to their community-driven solutions to the climate crisis that could also address a lot of the income and social inequalities that we're faced in Los Angeles today. As we know, climate change is a multiplier effect of crises. And when you add crises on top of crises on top of crises, the web of our society starts to break. So if you think about this in terms of the intersectional work that you're doing around housing, around jobs. Um, I want you to realize that this decision and moving forward with the LA Department of Water and Power will need to take your leadership. Um, what that looks like to me is you being able to answer the question of what do we do when LADWP decides to create hydrogen plants in basin without communicating or listening to the frontline communities that are right next to them. What are you going to do when they're starting to push biogas and realizing that that's going to be detrimental to the communities of the Central Valley? Thank you. Um, uh, what that's you need uh, to do that's is listen. two minutes, and we have to keep to the time, but thank you for your remarks. Appreciate it. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to speak on agenda item eight and general public comment. All right. Uh, one minute each. Please go ahead. Hello? Yes, caller. We, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. okay thank you. Um, good morning, Chair O'Farrell and city council members. My name is Catherine Pease, and I'm the director of science and policy at Heal the Bay. 
Field of Bay supports agenda item eight regarding the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant. Field of Bay has been tracking this issue closely since we learned of the horrifying 17 million gallon emergency discharge of raw sewage into the bay on July 11th and 12th. This incident and its aftermath have clearly highlighted numerous areas for immediate improvement, including increased and more effective communication, better protocols, appropriate implementation of protocols, better coordination amongst agencies and stakeholders, and the need for transparency. The recent revelation that the Hyperion plant has not been able to fully treat sewage for the last three weeks is extremely concerning, posing threats to marine ecosystems and public health. We all want the plant to get back to full functionality as soon as possible, and we do believe that the Bureau of Sanitation is working their hardest to do this. However, the public needs transparency, and we encourage the BOS to be quicker and more proactive in their communication and outreach going forward and for any future events that might occur. We urge the committee to approve this motion and we have additional recommendations. We recommend that public notification be most effective by utilizing multiple methods, including but not limited to social media, signage, text messages, press conferences, and television and radio notices. Further, communication must be conducted in multiple languages. We also recommend that protocols utilize the most recent science and methods that are most protective of public health, such as rapid DNA-based methods to detect bacteria levels in ocean waters and satellite imagery to track sewage plumes. We recommend that BOS and LA County initiate a multi-agency task force that includes a diverse group of stakeholders to review what happened, what needs to be improved or changed, and make recommendations. Thank you. We so fully much. support. It's thank been you. Two Please, please feel free to put all of this in an email and send it to my office. I thank you for your comments. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, Diana Nicole, landscape ecologist. I'm speaking um, general public comment in item one. Integrating biodiversity goals into the city shows real vision for a well-developed, contiguous, healthy and ecologically resilient citywide urban forest. But last week, Streets LA came out with a list of trees for our rights of way that does not integrate the goals of the motion in item number one, because the development of their list is based on an old landscape practice called right tree, right place, which is really unsophisticated and unremarkable for these times and does not support biodiversity. For instance, uh, the modern practice of street trees is make the place right for the tree. Otherwise, you get the same five or six trees and monocultures that do not support biodiversity. Looking at goals from other California cities, I found cities that had as much as 16 pages of well-developed goals articulated for their tree list, emphasizing things like native species, age diversity, habitat value for birds, ecological benefits or supporting food webs, habitat corridors, public health, and bringing people closer to nature. The goals for street trees, uh, street ballet's trees list based on the goal of right tree, right place, boiled down to four short items that go something like this. Trees that grow well in the soil and moisture for the place, trees that avoid collisions with power lines and buildings, trees that are pretty, trees that will increase your property value. What that got us is a list of some 80 tree species that are not native and only five native tree species, despite the fact that our locally native trees are best for biodiversity. Rather than mitigate the impacts of concrete, steel, and our shrinking landscapes due to density, a mostly non-native streetscape increases the urban food desert and is a threat to biodiversity. It certainly does nothing to inspire people to plant native trees in their own backyards. Thank really you, out of sync with our needs. Uh, please. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, good morning. This is Lydia calling from Venice, California. I'm with Society of Native Nations and SoCal 350. My concerns are about uh, general public comment number two and number eight. All right. Uh, one minute to those. for your comments and then one minute for general public. Okay. Well, uh, good morning. And um, I have to start off by saying that the Green New Deal 
needs to be rewritten um, because Indigenous people are on the last page, third to last paragraph. I don't know how that centers and amplifies our lives, our history, and our voices, and our connection to land, water, and all of our critter relatives. The Hyperion uh, plant, <laughs> are you kidding me? This is spewing and spilling out thousands, millions of gallons every day, every minute we speak here, and at the same time, there's plans for a desalination plant in El Segundo to capture that very same crap water to bottle it for us to drink. They want to desalinate it. Is there a memo or a note or some kind of science that I don't know about? Because all I know is that the toxic chemicals and brine that's going to be dumped back into the, the excess is going to be dumped back into the ocean. So we really need to dial in city, county, and state and make sure that we're speaking the same language, not only of equity and environmental justice, but also making sure that we're not further damaging and ruining our green future for the seven generations to come. And as far as the long-term strategy for 100% carbon-free, everything on this particular agenda I, is, is incorrect as long as it's not indigenous-centered, including the Army Corps of Engineers. You need to have Tongva relatives, Chumash, and, and even Hotsamen from the south, a little bit, you know, from the Long Beach territory. Mitchell Farrell, we need to do better with these relationships with the local tribal people. I'm, I'm expecting that. I'm expecting you to lead that charge. Thank you. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, are you there? Hi, I'd like to speak on general public comment and items one and two, please. All right, two minutes for your items and one minute for general public comment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Farmers. I live in the San Fernando Valley and uh, I'd like to express my agreement with the previous speakers about the uh, uh, biodiversity goals and the need to have more native tree species in the Streets LA uh, uh, tree list. It's important to make sure that our streets are supporting our biodiversity goals. Um, second, I'd like to uh, express my support for the uh, pathway for uh, achieving LA 100 by 2030. It is essential that we treat the climate emergency for what it is, uh, a, a potential life and death uh, matter. Uh, 2045 is too late to avoid severe impacts of climate change. Uh, we should align ourselves with President Biden's goal of a national target of 2035. Also, uh, social and environmental justice is essential. So first, we should make sure no one is left behind. Vulnerable environmental justice communities should be prioritized for local energy conservation and distributed energy resources and jobs. Uh, second, we need to make sure that local job creation generally is a priority, whether it's under the label of the Green New Deal uh, or otherwise. Um, uh, third, we need to make sure that gas plants are phased out in uh, vulnerable communities, such as the uh, Valley Generating Station. Um, also, we need to ensure just transition for workers in environmental justice communities. Uh, I'm surprised to see that there's no workforce language in here. So uh, we need to make sure that there are strong workforce standards, including prevailing wage, um, incorporated into this plan. Um, and I, I want to make sure that uh, there are project labor agreements that bring in individuals from disadvantaged communities. We should not allow the burning of biofuels, such as corn oil, wood pellets, or animal waste, even if they're technically classified as renewable. They still emit pollutants, 
um, and they still have environmental costs in terms of land use and water that are unacceptable. We also should not uh, replace our gas plants with hydrogen plants. Uh, 95% of hydrogen production in the United States comes from natural gas, uh, and so we need to have uh, a, an infrastructure that is not enabling uh, continued use of natural gas, even thank, if it's outside you, the... Sir. That, that's been two minutes, but thank you for, for your comments. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Yes, hello, my name is Terry Saucy. I'd like to speak in support of agenda item number two. Right, one minute, please. Okay, I'm a member of the Tarzana Neighborhood Council. I'm calling on behalf of myself, the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance, and the San Fernando Valley Chapter of Climate Reality. First, I'd like to thank you for voting on this important item. As the NREL study clearly shows, it is possible within our grasp to reach 100% renewable by 2035. Rather than suffering from the devastating effects of climate change with increased temperatures, mega droughts, and wildfires, we wait until 2045 to reach 100% renewable, it'll be too late to avoid the severest impacts and possibly reverse the course we're on. LEDWP in the city of LA need to be a statewide and national leader. It's also vital that this plan addresses the social environmental justice front as climate change unequally affects frontline and vulnerable communities while also providing a just transition for workers and environmental justice communities. Thank you so much for looking at this motion. Thank you. Caller, please stay your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Uh -huh. Great. My name is David Hockey, and I'd like to provide general public comment and also comment on item number two. All right, one minute for each. Please go ahead. Honorable City Council members, I'm with the Sierra Club, and I'm speaking today to thank you for your outstanding leadership in bringing forward the motion that instructs DWP to create a strategic long-term resource plan that achieves 100% carbon-free energy by 2035. We're also incredibly pleased with the additional motion that increases hiring from city neighborhoods in environmentally and economically disadvantaged communities. This is how the city of Los Angeles shows the rest of the nation that it's not just about when we get to 100% renewable energy, but also how we get there. Climate change disproportionately impacts vulnerable and frontline communities. So let's address social justice and environmental justice by prioritizing those communities for local energy conservation programs and distributed energy resources like rooftop solar and energy storage, as well as training programs and project labor agreements that will create the workforce that will get us to net zero carbon. Let's reinvest in our communities so that both our energy grid and our communities are more resilient and able to face the climate crisis that is already upon us. The best way to transform our energy infrastructure and get to 100% renewable energy is to make sure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Caller, we are ready for you. Connor Roberts for the Southern California Watershed Alliance, the Environmental Water Caucus, and others. Uh, general comment and Item number eight, please. All right, one minute for each. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Chair and council members, um, you know, I can't say I stand before you. I'm actually driving to a meeting of West Basin Water District that refused to do what you're doing is allowing us to call in. Uh, my concern is that over 40 years, um, I have been waiting for a clean, Santa Monica Bay and the continued problems at Hyperion, yet all the planning that's available to move forward with 100% recycled water needs to be done now, not later. In the midst of climate change, fires, water supply issues, um, make this a priority, pass the motion, and let us work with forward 
with solutions to the situation we're in now and not desalination plants, which only create more climate change and provide very little water at a high price. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks for calling in while driving. I, I hope it was hands-free. Uh, next caller, please. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. We can hear you. Hi, yes, this, is, yeah. this is Bruce Resnick from LA Waterkeeper. I'm speaking on item eight and general public comment. All right, you have one minute for each. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I would like to first uh, thank uh, and support the motion presented for number eight to move us forward on the Hyperion spill. Um, I would also like to echo uh, what other speakers have said, in particular um, what Connor just said and, and Captain Peace from Heal the Bay, particularly uh, related to the need for more rapid or real-time indicator testing and better outreach. Um, I will note some environmental leaders, myself included, actually toured the facility yesterday. We appreciate L.A. San and Barbara Romero for making that possible. And the main takeaway was as bad as things are, and, and it's bad, and, and the environmental and the public health threats, it could have been much, much more catastrophic. Um, it was very sobering. And so as part of the motion, um, I particularly want to echo the need to get to the bottom of what happened. We cannot fix things if we do not know what happened, and that is absolutely critical. But I, the second point I wanted to make, and this goes to what Connor was saying, is um, the last part of the motion, which we really support, which is the need to expedite new state-of-the-art water purification plant at Iperia known as Operation Next. We have long been an advocate, and I serve on the technical and community advisory committees for Operation Next. But the one thing I don't think is being looked at, and that the spill kind of highlighted yesterday, or the, the spill of July 11th highlighted, is we need to look at if we can decentralize that water purification system throughout the sewer set. A decentralized system, not without its own challenges, can be more cost effective, less energy intensive for pumping water, but it also takes some of the pressure off a single facility at Hyperion and lessens the chance for a single catastrophic event like we had on July 11th. So at a minimum, I would love, um, as planning for Operation Next moves forward, including environmental review, that the city and LA San at least explore the opp uh, opportunities for decentralized approach for water pur purification. And we uh, at LA Waterkeeper look forward to Thank working you. with the city Thank and LA San on that. Thank you for calling. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello? Yes, caller, we hear you. Uh, please okay. uh, state some of the items. Hello, my name is Ariel Lopez, and I would like to speak on agenda item two and general public comment. All right, one minute for each. Please go ahead. Good morning, Chair Farrell and honorable committee members. I'm a sustainability policy and programs associate at the Los Angeles Business Council. At the LABC, we understand strong environmental policies are imperative for California to fight against climate change. This is why we're very proud to be an active participant on the LA 100 Advisory Group for the past four years. The economy of the state of California is the largest in the United States and is fifth in the world, powering the most populous and prosperous city in the state with 100% carbon-free energy by 2035 would help California to continue to lead the nation toward a 100% clean energy future while addressing climate change for all. With increasing environmental and climate threats, it is becoming progressively important for California to generate energy that produces no greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels. Besides reducing California's greenhouse gas emissions, 100% clean electricity will create jobs and economic growth throughout California, reduce local pollution from reduced fossil fuel use, and create cleaner, healthier air and less pollution in vulnerable communities where power plants are often located. Plummeting wind, solar, and storage prices have fallen so fast that Los Angeles can certainly reach 100% clean electricity by 2035 without raising customer costs at all from today's levels and actually decreasing wholesale power costs by 10%. Wind, solar, and storage can deliver massive emission reductions and economic growth without increasing consumer costs. Most existing research targeted 2050 as when a net zero power sector was possible. The targeting 100% clean electricity by 2035 leverages existing low-cost options to achieve the emissions reduction pace required for a safe climate future. By pushing to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2035, we can also further expand solar programs and incentives in LA, like the feed-in tariff program, 
which the LABC has been working tirelessly to promote, that helps businesses and property owners to transition to renewable energy in a cost-effective way. For this reason, the LABC strongly urges support for this motion that instructs the LADWP to present a strategic long-term research plan that sets the 100% renewable energy deadline to 2035 uh, and identifies the projects you, that must You're be implemented all... immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got it all in, and I, I know I hate having to limit time, but it's going to be a long meeting. We only have a few more callers, so I'm going to extend this for five more minutes, and that way we'll get all the callers in, so please go ahead. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Is there a link that I'd like to speak on agenda item eight in general public comment? All right, one minute for each. Please begin. Thank you. Good morning, committee members. My name is Ben Harris, and I'm the staff attorney at Los Angeles Waterkeeper. I support the motion presented in item eight, and I thank the committee for the opportunity to speak. I also want to note that I agree with the previous comment uh, made from Catherine Pease from Peel to Bay and from Bruce Resnick, the executive director of LA Waterkeeper. Uh, along with Bruce, I toured the Hyperion facility yesterday, and I too want to emphasize that the sewage spill was a disastrous incident. During the tour, I observed significant damage to many buildings that were flooded with sewage and vital equipment at the plant is still offline. As a result of the spill, members of the public were exposed to health threats in the water and continue to experience noxious odors, and the plant's discharges into the ocean are still potentially harming the marine environment weeks later. That being said, the incident could have been much more catastrophic if not for the efforts of sanitation staff to react quickly to the spill. And I just want to say I do applaud their efforts to uh, do everything that they could to minimize the damage to the plant and to protect the public from further harm. I want to offer two brief takeaways, one which Bruce already addressed, which is that it is vital for us to identify the cause of this spill. After the tour yesterday, it seems unclear, even to sanitation staff, what the exact cause of the spill was. We can't fix the problems with the plant until we know why specifically those problems arose. Second, along with other commenters, I want to emphasize the need to ensure that all uh, notice protocols at both the county and city levels are followed correctly, which we know is not the case here for the County Department of Health. In particular, one area for improvement that I wanted to suggest is with bacteria sampling protocol. You might not realize that for cost reasons, standard nearshore bacteria monitoring requires to incubate for 24 hours. So what beach advisories really mean is that the area was contaminated a day or two before. When there is a known spill like what happened here a few weeks ago, the city should work with the county to undertake rapid bacteria indicator monitoring so Thank that we you. can post beach advisories Thank in real time. Thank you, caller. We'll be able to squeeze the last few in. Thank you for your remarks. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi there. Can you all hear me? We can. Hi. Um, my name is Jane Harper, and I'm a constituent in Mar Vista, and I'd like to make a general uh, comment and speak on agenda item eight today. Okay, um, one, thank two, you three. so much. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> thank you so much for, uh, for your time. Um, in regards to the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant spill, um, I'd like to say that I was disappointed with the lack of communication with the public about this catastrophic event. Um, I've spoken with a significant number of fishermen and people who regularly use uh, the beach and water in my community who weren't aware of this at all, which is, is kind of a little horrifying. Um, in regards to the response, I'd like to see Los Angeles quickly transition away from the antiquated facility that um, spilled out into the ocean and move towards a modern state-of-the-art sewage facility that purifies wastewater and recharges groundwater. Um, this would not only prevent further spills, but also safeguard our water supply against future earthquakes and just be more energy, uh, much more energy efficient than desalinization, desalination. Um, I'd also like to see uh, the water sample results posted to the public be reflective of current conditions rather than days old results. Um, I've worked in the surf industry for several years and I know that unfortunately um, how useless water sample results are when, they, when it comes to making decisions about whether or not it's safe to be in the water. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, and next and last caller. Caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on.
caller, please state your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, thank you for your patience. My name is Estella Suarez Hamilton. I am a Los Angeles resident, not a, lo not a lobbyist, not a lawyer, and I'd like to speak on the eighth, like everybody else, <laughs> in a public okay. comment, please. One minute each, please thank begin. You. As, a, as a community member, you know, I wanted to express my concern that there's a lot of lobbyists on this phone call, and a lot of them have, you know, their, their interests, they're doing their job. What I would like to say is that I am for desalination simply because it is a, I don't think it's antiquated. I think that it is a great way to lead by example, which I heard Councilwoman say earlier, city leading by example, which I think is so important. Um, desalination is, is actually pretty new, so the technology isn't there quite there yet. But what we have is very interesting, and I think kind of like oil, those ways can be used for energy in the future. So I think that we should put our money into looking for solutions for desalination. We have um, some really great benefits from it. I'm not a scientist, I am just a regular person. My public comment I wanted to speak about is, please, like I said, leading by example. I love that Councilwoman said that. In any of your decisions, for all of the things that you guys voted on today, please, in the future, prioritize independence, kindness in our American values of free choice. Due to the climate of force that we have in politics right now, I had a horrible nightmare about chaos in the streets last night. I woke up clinging to my partner, crying. There is stress right now in our consciousness. And please, as our leaders, stand up for us. Stand up for independence. And um, also stand up for some, some new methods of environmental protection. I think that you guys are you guys are working hard. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And I want to thank everyone who took the time to call in from their homes, their cars, uh, and give uh, public comment. We really appreciate your participation. It is critical. Uh, and I always take notes throughout the public comment section for things that stand out. So we are listening, and we appreciate everyone's uh, volunteer and participation. So, so colleagues, uh, I'm going to recommend that, recommend that we take item nine. We continue it. Uh, there are still some details to be worked out on this item. So we'll continue this um, uh, for a, a future date. If there are no objections, we'll just, we'll just do that. And I think there are no objections. So um, unless there is an objection also, colleagues, I'd like to move items four, five, six, seven, and ten on consent. Again, that's items four, five, six, seven, and 10 on consent. That still leaves us with a very, very heavy <laughs> uh, agenda here. Uh, so if there are no objections, we'll just do that as well and move right along. All right. Uh, so colleagues, I'd like, now like to move to item number one. Uh, Mr. Prieto, if you could please read item number one. Mr. Chair. Certainly, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Item number one relates to your sanitation Chair. report relative to the progress on biodiversity initiatives and related pilot projects. Mr. Chair, would you like me to call the vote uh, on the consent item? Oh, and yeah. I, I, uh, I don't think I'll so. I'll second it, Mr. Chair, if you wish. Yeah, if there were no objections. Oh, Mr. Ridley Thomas, would you like to hear a roll call? No, but if you need one, okay. I'll, I'm glad to second it. Oh, thank you. I just I want to move this along. If there are no objections, we can uh, we can spare the roll call uh, today Got it. without objection. That's why I just kind of moved along. I certainly don't mean to stifle anyone. If you if you want to hear the items, that certainly is not my intent. All right, thank you. So we'll just go ahead and um, uh, yes. So we we uh, did we read item one? Uh, yes, we did. So okay. you have staff okay. on hand too. Fantastic. Okay, so. A lot of calls today uh, about uh, this uh, biodiversity uh, motion. So, you know, we have a unique uh, wealth of biodiversity in Los Angeles. Not always very visible, but it is omnipresent in every neighborhood. Uh, and as leaders of environmental stewardship, we definitely have a duty to protect and manage our ecosystems. They're fragile. They're at risk because of climate change. Uh, and, um, you know, sometimes questionable development practices. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do in this regard. And I understand that representatives from LA Sanitation are here and we'll do a short presentation regarding the progress of the city's various biodiversity initiatives. 
So if sanitation is ready, please let your voice be known and we can start the presentation. Yes, good morning. Let me just have a second to share my screen. Thank you, good morning. All right, so good morning. My name is Michelle Barton and I'm the staff lead for LACN's biodiversity program. And as many of you probably already know, LACN's biodiversity program originated in 2017 with the Biodiversity Council motion from Council Member Paul Koretz. And amongst other things, this motion directed us at LACN to create a customized biodiversity index for LA. I'll also point out that LA's Green New Deal includes a number of biodiversity goals, most notably the one shown here, no net loss of native biodiversity. So to go about these goals, the internal LACN biodiversity team decided to convene three other groups, an interdepartmental team, a biodiversity expert council, and a stakeholder group. And all of these teams have been absolutely crucial to the success of our program and to building consensus. So as a first step in creating a customized index for the city of LA, we decided to measure an existing index, the Singapore Index on Cities Biodiversity. So to do so, we convened our expert council for a two-day workshop, and we published the results in our 2018 biodiversity report, the cover of which and the summary score table are both shown here. And the Singapore index process was very informative and a really great first step to get our expert council excited and engaged in this concept of creating a customized index. And while the Singapore index, excuse me, wasn't a perfect fit for LA, the expert council really valued a lot of the metrics in it. So ultimately we decided to retain three and modify 11 of the metrics from this index in our LA index. We also added 11 brand new metrics. So we pub we've published the results of our customized index building process in our 2020 biodiversity report. And this report includes four chapters, the first of which is on our brand new index. The second is on our ecotopes framework. The third presents some preliminary connectivity analysis and habitat, habitat quality mapping. And the last presents some case studies. The final customized index for the city of LA shown here has three themes, native species protection and enhancement shown in green, social equity considerations shown in gold, and governance and management of biodiversity shown in blue. And these themes are broken into eight indicators and 25 metrics. And I know this is hard to read, so next I'll walk you through some of our indicators. So the eight indicators included in the index are shown here. They are habitat quality, indicator species, threats to native biodiversity, access to biodiversity, education, community action, governance, and management. And collectively, these topics comprehensively assess not only what's happening to the habitats and how well connected various habitats are, but how the city is engaging with students and the larger community on this topic of biodiversity and how the city itself is working to protect endangered species and manage threats like invasive species. And I want to point out that perhaps most importantly, due to the way this index was developed, there is local consensus around the framework presented here and the metrics included. And it, it really is our hope that in the future, LA County and other neighboring jurisdictions will adopt either our index or a slightly modified version of the framework. I quickly just want to touch upon our ecotopes framework, which is presented in chapter two of our biodiversity report. And because LA is such a large varied city, it made sense for us to look at biodiversity metrics in certain smaller units. Uh, based on landform, microclimate, and vegetation. And so we have developed 27 ecotopes for the region and 16 for the city of LA, which are shown on this figure here. Certain biodiversity metrics will be measured within these ecotopes as we proceed with the baseline measurement. 
before wrapping up, I do want to just mention a few other accomplishments of our biodiversity program. So in May 2021, the city of LA became the largest city in the US to be certified as a community wildlife habitat by the National Wildlife Federation. And to achieve this really incredible certification, we at the city of LA encouraged resident schools and other organizations to garden with wildlife in mind using native plants and sustainable practices, providing cover and food for wildlife and reducing or eliminating the use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. And ultimately, Angelinos registered over 1200 spaces to allow us as a city to become certified as a whole. Uh, the last thing I will mention is that we are really working at LACN to incorporate biodiversity into other projects. So in March 2021, LACN submitted a grant application to the California Natural Resources Agency for a project called the Slauson Corridor Making Connections. And the work will be anchored around a metro project that is redesigning a former rail, rail line into a multi-purpose path. And if funded, our project will plant 1,600 new street trees and install thousands of California native drought tolerant understory plants to enhance this path and increase the wildlife habitat uh, connectivity and create some stepping stones in this low canopy uh, park poor neighborhood. And this is the first time that we're actually including native understory with an urban forestry grant project. And so we are really excited and hope that the project will be approved by the California Natural Resources Agency. At this point, we've advanced to stage two of three. So we are keeping our fingers crossed that that project will be funded. And I, I bring this project up as an example of how important it is to add biodiversity elements to urban forestry projects or even stormwater or soil projects that will really create the multi-benefit projects that we need to protect human health and our biodiversity. So just to wrap up, in terms of our next steps, our biodiversity program is working to complete the baseline measurement of this brand new LA City Biodiversity <coughs> Index. And we plan to continue our work with the expert council and other city departments on our interdepartmental team, many of which are listed here, to promote different practices, programs, and projects that support biodiversity connectivity and just make LA more sustainable and resilient. So with that, thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Ms. Barton, thank you for this really terrific presentation. Really appreciate it. A couple of quick questions off the top of my head. Is this presentation available, uh, easily available to the general public uh, on the website perhaps or uh, to our offices that we can help distribute it? This presentation was made specifically for you all, but we have iterations of this presentation that go into much more depth available on our website for download, but I would be happy to work with your office to distribute this exact one. Terrific, thank you so much. Uh, and then in terms of, you mentioned um, native tree canopy. So uh, you, you're basically, um, I don't want to assume anything. You're working with uh, uh, Streets LA and ur urban forestry on, on that issue because some conversation and public comment was about the lack of a, a focus of native species to grow our tree canopy as opposed, you know, as opposed to the opposite. Yeah, so the project I mentioned is actually an LA SAN grant project that the tree planting team here is putting forth. But there is definitely partnership with Streets LA, with Metro, with City Plants, and with Rachel Mallorich, our city forest officer, on that project. And um, all of the trees that will be planted for that project will be drought tolerant and natives will be prioritized if space permits. But it's really the understory, the shrubs that will be going in underneath that are going to be those natives. And that's what makes this project, I think, really unique. Terrific. And a conversation to update our approach for urban forestry within uh, within Streets LA, that, that conversation will be ongoing and taking place, I assure the callers who, who called in. Uh, biodiversity is so important, just, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my backyard. I put fresh water out every single day, and at night, when I turn on the light to let my dog out, I've seen raccoons drinking, uh, the skunks are making their way, the possums, 
uh, the raccoons outweigh my dog by about two, so I make sure the yard is all clear. Uh, I've got uh, indigenous local native milkweed, and I've got a monarch uh, diversity thing going. So, so everyone who has a, a is fortunate enough to have a yard or even a balcony uh, can participate in helping the biodiversity of Los Angeles by, to the degree that you possibly can, uh, plant native shrubs, trees, and plants uh, in large and small ways. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile. It makes life fascinating. And the wildlife will come to you if you handle it responsibly, of course. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's a, a, a beautiful uh, effort uh, by the city on this biodiversity. So a, a few questions. Um, can you discuss the impact, uh, if any, in relation to COVID-19 affecting ecosystems or any of our biodiversity initiatives, even if it's impacted your shop in this effort? Yeah, so of course COVID has brought so many complications to the work all of us at the city do. Uh, one of the things that was really disappointing was that last year and this year, the City Nature Challenge, which is a really great initiative to get the community excited about the biodiversity we have within our cities and to take pictures and upload those pictures to iNaturalist has been modified. But, you know, even though we can't come together and do bio blitzes, we at LA SAN have partnered with the LA Public Library on a new initiative called the LA Bio Blitz Challenge, in which we're getting people outside to photograph pictures of our indicator species, which are pretty special. These are 37 charismatic species that we are very fortunate to have here in LA. And the response we've seen in terms of participation and excitement from the community, especially since people have been pent up and inside or not socializing in the same way has been incredible. And so I think that's been one kind of social impact of COVID-19. But I think the other thing is that, especially early on in the pandemic, when we saw the streets deserted, when there was less car traffic, when fewer people were outside, biodiversity came back into our cities. And this happened not just here locally, but around the world. And there's a really beautiful film out. It's a short documentary that has some images of all of this called The Year the Earth Changed, narrated by David Attenborough, that really just shows how some of these simple, simple changes that we can make in our lives and our cities can create an environment that will allow humans and nature to better coexist. And it's it's actually a really uplifting film and one I recommend. And are you working with our, our parks department for our, our big regional parks and even our smaller parks in terms of native landscaping, uh, native plants that can also encourage greater biodiversity? There's such opportunity in Griffith Park and Elysian Park uh, for, for this effort. Absolutely. So we also at LASAN have a healthy soils program and we're working with a few nonprofits, namely Kiss the Ground and LA Compost, to create a training course that will be piloted with recreation and park staff to promote organic landscape ma management and also train staff how to garden with native plants and how to use sustainable practices. And we're very excited about this partnership and getting the training materials up and running. Terrific. One of your focused neighborhoods was Elysian Valley, which I represent on the city council uh, to model urban and, and narrative biodiversity. So what, uh, what are some of the takeaways from that? And can, can this study be modeled in other parts of the city? It's along the river. So maybe I'm sure that's a, a major component. Yes. And just to clarify, are you referring to chapter three of the biodiversity report with the preliminary connectivity work? Uh, Yes, uh, it, in, in relation to, you know, the Elysian Valley uh, and, and, you know, urban to uh, natural. Yeah, I think the Elysian Valley is a particularly interesting case study and a big reason why it was chosen for this preliminary connectivity work. With Griffith Park, this incredible, large, natural and urban park, there are opportunities, I think, that show up in some of the mapping in our report to enhance the connections that we can create for wildlife to disperse and share their genetic material 
across different natural areas or in some cases smaller urban areas and i think really what that chapter shows is for elysian valley and for the city as a whole we can create small stepping stones corridors and other ways to really connect our habitats and integrate habitat and green into the entire city and lastly you know first peoples uh, in, in the la area in the indigenous communities it simply existed uh, and in, in nature with great biodiversity. So are, are we working with indigenous communities uh, and the descendants of uh, some of the local tribal nations? I've recently been on a number of calls with different indigenous representatives, but I think we should probably invite a couple members of tribes to be part of our expert council. Um, I can definitely add that to my to-do list. I think that could be very, very helpful. Uh, so thank you for that. I, I, lastly, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Caress uh, for his leadership in authoring uh, this motion. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Mr. Caress, for remarks and questions, and then everyone else after that. Well, thank you for uh, having this hearing today, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to start by commending Moss and Michelle and the rest of Sanitation's biodiversity team and our interdepartmental biodiversity team and our biodiversity expert group. Um, and in particular, the brilliant Isaac Brown, uh, who have all done such a tremendous job with this effort. Um, I have a few questions and then uh, after my colleagues have had a chance to speak, I'll have a few additional recommendations. And first quest, couple of questions you, you touched upon. Um, how do you feel the team has done on the environmental justice component of the original motion about equitable access to nation? That's a great question. Um, so one of my colleagues worked with a summer intern last year to do some preliminary mapping on access to parks and natural areas. And I will be continuing that work and incorporating it into our baseline measurement of the biodiversity index, since we do have a metric that looks at access to our biodiverse areas. The other thing that we have really been trying to drill down on is how we can use schools as parks and opportunities to create habitat. And so one of the ways we've modified one of our metrics in the biodiversity index is to look for ways that LAUSD can have joint use agreements and turn their spaces, especially the ones that have some of these beautiful habitats on campus, like Esperanza Elementary School, into park resources for people to access in areas that have limited park space. Okay, and, uh... Uh, what are the next steps on the pilot projects in our mentioned in our LA City Index report, including uh, the one mentioned in Elysian Valley? Um, and how do we uh, how do we move these along? And how do we use these as uh, pilot approaches to get the whole city involved? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think one of the most powerful tools we have at our, at our disposal, excuse me, is our expert council. They are an incredible source of knowledge, of resources, of ideas, and ability to, I think, execute projects. And so I think if we want to push some projects forward, we can work through our expert council and work with them perhaps as co-PIs to develop some interesting proposals that can really push these initiatives forward. I'll look forward to seeing that happen. Um, also, uh, some of you may know, I hired an urban ecologist, uh, Kat Superfiski, out of my own office discretionary fund for a couple of years to ensure the work on the wildlife corridor, wildlife corridor ordinance um, could get completed in the planning, planning department. She's now on planning staff, and thank you to Council Member Krikorian and the rest of our colleagues on budget committee for making that happen. Uh, and I know that many other departments also used her services during that time, including our urban forest team, DWP, LA River team, other divisions of the planning department. 
And she's also been a valuable representative of the city to a number of events and symposiums. So Michelle, just as a point of reference, could you give us a brief summary of how often CAT worked to consult with sanitation on related issues and whether you think it might be valuable for the city to look into creating a permanent urban ecologist position? I absolutely think it would be an incredible asset to the city to create a permanent urban ecologist position. Working with CAT over the last year and a half has been incredibly helpful. CAT is an incredible resource and just source of knowledge and ideas. And you know, sometimes I've worked with her daily, sometimes it's a little less frequent, but we have been partners on so many efforts and initiatives as the work that we're individually doing has so many common ties. And I have valued my time with her and really hope that that position can be institutionalized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, Mr. Kokorian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great report, lots of meat in this uh, that I wish I had more time to talk about. So I'll try to be as quick as I can. Number one, uh, none of this would have ever happened if it hadn't been for council member Paul Koretz. And so I think we have to really emphasize our appreciation to Mr. Koretz who has been relentless in pursuing uh, this issue and the necessary staffing and organization to get it done. Um, he's so relentless and has been for so many years that even now in this hearing with his questions, he's trying to lobby the budget and finance committee even now so, Mr. Kretz, uh, congratulations <laughs> on the steps that you've taken uh, to make all of this. Um, uh, second, speaking of budgets, um, the state budget has set aside over $8 billion uh, for biodiversity related um, investments and biodiversity, climate resiliency and, and so forth. And so um, it may be, I, I hope that this is not premature to ask this, but in the interest of striking while the iron is hot, uh, do, does the department have some recommendations or, uh, or can it quickly develop some recommendations for shovel ready priorities uh, to tap into that fund? And what steps are we taking to in fact engage to ensure that we uh, are fully participating in, in accessing them. That's a great question. So I think the first, the first part is best answered by, again, leaning on our expert council. I think that collectively, if we use our expert council as a resource, we can develop some prioritized lists of recommendations to move forward with. Um, I, I think, I, to answer some of the rest of it, I might punt to our Assistant General Manager, Moss Dojiri. <laughs> thanks, Michelle, and, and thanks for your presentation. It's excellent. Um, I, I think that there's actually two um, avenues we can approach, and they're not mutually exclusive. One, the first one is what uh, Michelle Botton brought up. We could be uh, co-principal investigators with local uh, academics from the local universities around uh, Los Angeles to get uh, uh, projects uh, proposed and, um, and sharing the funding. Um, that's one way. Um, the, the second approach is um, to try to get a grant person um, and, and perhaps um, an extra staff person for the biodiversity program. Um, our biodiversity program so far since 2017 has had no budget. We have national and international recognition on essentially zero budget. And we did that by, by utilizing um, the expert council. And so um, I think if we really want to go for some big grants um, that the uh, funding is available, we would probably need some resources to help support us to do that and pursue it, um, as well as someone that would help us implement um, the projects moving forward. Well, um, that concerns me a little bit because I would hate to miss this opportunity. And by the time we move resources, hire a grant person, you know, do the research, do the hiring, that we'll have missed the opportunity. So I would, I would ask that um, the, the Bureau's leadership um, really sit down and think what 
what are the priorities that we've had for years that we know that we've had for years and maybe it involves accelerating some of the work that we've done on uh you know uh, planning around the tree canopy and the uh, inventory and the you know those sorts of things that the, the tree report the, some of the things that are in the hopper ready to go and we don't need to get a grant person so much as we need to align uh political leadership and use our existing los angeles city lobbying team uh to get into this fight right now not a year from now because it won't be there then so yep. um, this it's very important yeah um, re so related to that um on on trees just to follow up on mr o'farrell's uh, point uh, i don't need an answer on this now but, but i guess it would, i'd make more of a suggestion that um when it comes to uh, looking at our tree inventory and our selection of species to enhance biodiversity um, clearly it's important to focus on native species rather than just species that are drought resistant and friendly to our paved infrastructure right so so native is the key uh, part of that equation uh, but ms d'antonio and i think others have have raised the issue that there are um, practical barriers to that in the private sector. I mean, the accessibility of saplings that are native is a real challenge. And so I would, I don't need an answer now, but I would just ask the, the Bureau really look at how can we reach out into the private sector and, and help to free up some of those barriers so that we're better positioned to be able to take full advantage of native planting. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to rip through this quickly. So in the interest of time, uh, the, oh, the last issue is, um, has, has there been participation on the expert council or otherwise from, uh, folks at the LA County, uh, natural history museum, because they have a robust program of community science. And, um, it, it seems to me that that there's a lot of room for synergy with the work that they're already doing. It's a good idea. Yes, absolutely. They are valued partners in many things and they are well represented on our expert council. Great. In fact, we we co-planned a biodiversity kind of community science roundtable to try to figure out how we could engage additional people that are not participating in biodiversity science and it was very successful. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for your great work. Thanks, Mr. Kokora and Mr. DeLeon. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Chair, uh, very much. And, and Michelle, thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation on biodiversity. Just one thing that um, I think it was Mr. Koretz, um, or perhaps Mr. O'Farrell, who had brought it up, is that, that clearly we want to take advantage of every dollar that's out there, especially when it comes to equity. And this may not be in your bailiwick per se, but more so um, in recs and in, in, in parks, uh, but sort of kind of goes hand in hand when we're talking about, you know, canopies uh, in neighborhoods, canopies in parks and open space. And the, the issue that we lack so greatly um, in, in a handful of, uh, uh, city council districts in particular, and even other council districts of, of financial means, they will have pockets of, of low-income neighborhoods as well, too. So largely concentrated in districts like CD14, CD1, uh, CD9, um, uh, but um, you'll have uh, 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 low-income neighborhoods in, in other areas as well, too, such as the Sikorians, uh, where uh, equity is, is, is important as well, too. Um, want to make sure um, I wrote uh, Senate Bill 5, uh, which uh, materialized in 2018 into uh, Proposition 68. And we need to make sure that we really take advantage of that. All those dollars that are coming in. We have at least $800 million uh, when it comes to equity in, in parks. Uh, that's a statewide you know, number, not specific to the county or city of LA. But obviously, because we're the largest uh, uh, city in California, um, with quite frankly, um, at least number-wise, numbers-wise, maybe 
perhaps not percentage wise, but in terms of raw numbers, uh, the largest uh, uh, need uh, clearly in the state of California. We really had to strike quickly. And I think that Mr. Kokorin stroke, the, I think the right tone. Sometimes when we sort of kind of analyze things, perhaps a little bit too much, you know, we become paralyzed. And then when we're ready to strike, the money's gone, it's disappeared. Because other folks, you know, with their lobbying teams have struck very quickly. And uh, uh, we don't want to be in that position. We want to take advantage of, of, of every dollar, especially when you have Angelino elected officials at the statewide level who are trying to deliver. We need our local folks to take advantage of that opportunity very quickly if we're going to provide the equity as it comes to our biodiversity when it comes to parks and open space so all of our kids can uh, have access to it, in particular uh, low income kids. Again, I know this is not part of your bailiwick, you know, Michelle, you know, because you're at, at, at LA Sands, but it sort of kind of goes hand in hand. And, and clearly, when we have that opportunity to speak with, uh, the, the uh, Rex and Park folks um, will really drive that message because we want to take advantage of every single dollar that's available before it, it disappears. Um, because when these dollars materialize, the dollars materialize because of political leadership. That's how it got there. You know, political leadership that moved it. You know, uh, we like to think sometimes it was an academic report from SC or UCLA or Caltech or. It was this report that came out from the Biodiversity Coalition of XYZ and ABC. Oftentimes it's not, you know, it's driven just by raw political leadership and the values and principles that get it across the finish line to give it to the voters to do all that hard work. And then we end up with our hands on our pocket because we were just too slow to, to maneuver and get the dollars would be a huge, huge monument of failure on our part. And that's why I think that you guys um, we'll have to really step up to take advantage of those dollars. That's all. Thank you much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. And thank, thank you, gentlemen, for all of your comments. Uh, Mr. Kikorian, did you have something else to add? Very quickly, Mr. Chair, sure. thank you. I just wanted to follow up on Mr. DeLeon's point because it was so important. And, and I just want to remind uh, departmental staff uh, that literally seven members of the Los Angeles City Council are former members of the California State Legislature, including the former President Pro Tem of the State Senate, Mr. De Leon. So um, within the council, there are considerable resources to be able to reach out to our friends in Sacramento and make these things real without starting from scratch. And so, and I think we lose sight of that far too often. Um, so please keep in mind that it, it, you just present the ideas uh, and let's not, you know, make a big issue of trying to figure out how we're going to uh, go and hire somebody to get that done or to pursue it. Um, lean on the members of the council as well for the, you know, relationships that we have in Sacramento as well. Mr. 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 Chairman, yes. if I may. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Ridley Thomas. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I would like to um, pitch my wagon to those last two previous remarks and ask that uh, the staff take full advantage of uh, Mr. Koretz's uh, lobbying skills because as is evidenced in this committee, he is absolutely shameless. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Yep. <laughs> you know, shameless works in politics, man, yes. especially in Sacramento. Let's be I'm shameless. A, I'm, I'm a witness. <laughs> <laughs> you have the lived experience, man. <laughs> so, so along those lines, uh, in, in all seriousness and humor, uh, I'll be going to Sacramento in September. Give me what you got because I will take the message and we, anyone can join me and let's put something together. Uh, Mr. Koretz, uh, Mr. Koretz, the sleight of hand expert lobbyist. Go right ahead, sir. I, well, I'll take no credit for it. I just wanted to say uh, uh, I, I believe you have some recommendations and I have some I'd like to make uh, after you put yours forward. Yes, uh, absolutely. So the, the recommendation that I'm adding is just to uh, officially, formally include uh, local indigenous communities into the conversation uh, and uh, suggestions moving forward as it relates to biodiversity. And Mr. Koretz, I understand uh, you have uh, some recommendations to add. Please, please go ahead. Yes, uh, the first one I think dovetails uh, with what you've just said. Um, I'd like to ask sanitation and the biodiversity teams 
to consult with both the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office and the Civil and Human Rights and Equity Department and report back more robustly on biodiversity, equity, and access to nature. And perhaps forming a biodiversity equity expert group might be in order and certainly uh, uh, with a focus on including uh, indigenous communities. Uh, number two, I'd like to ask sanitation and the biodiversity interdepartmental team departments and the proprietary proprietaries uh, to report back uh, with the creation of department specific biodiversity plans, uh, including how, how each department intersects with native biodiversity issues, how to protect and enhance native biodiversity in city department operations and areas over which the city has oversight and for them to include recommendations for a percentage improvement per department each year until we achieve a no biodiversity loss goal uh, as soon as possible. Uh, also, a few specific suggestions I'd like to ask for them to explore. Um, one, with planning in the lead, study and report back on how to educate the city builders and the public about the specific problem of bird building coalitions, uh, co I should say collision, collisions, and recommendations on how to avoid them. Um, this has been a, a problem for some time, but there's more awareness and more best practices out there now. And I'd like to ask that we include an examination of the Congressional Bird Safe Buildings Act and what they're doing to avoid bird building collisions in New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, and San Jose and what we need to do to adopt bird safe building standard measures in Los Angeles. Uh, number two, with Rec and Parks in the lead, report back on how to adopt the Audubon Cooperative Sanctuary Program for all of our golf courses, which are currently not included in some of our biodiversity efforts. Um, number three, all the biodiversity teams uh, could study and report back with recommendations for how to integrate nature-centered design into city projects, uh, development projects citywide and city-scale planning, and to report on the health and environmental and economic benefits for building occupants and urban environments. Also, I'd like to ask the Department of Public Works to work with the CLA and CAO to report back on the very apparent need uh, for the city departments to have a full-time urban ecologist including uh, the times Kat Superfiski spent working with sanitation, LA River team, DWP, the city forest officer, and uh, on other important uh, environmental planning issues beside the wildlife corridors and the funding and process for creating a permanent urban ecologist position similar to our city forest officer. Um, also, the mayor has recently signed on to the C40 Cities Urban Nature Declaration, so I'd like sanitation to include that in the next report back so that the council can examine and formally adopt it. And lastly, as was discussed by uh, Council Member Kikorian and others, uh, Governor Newsom has set aside an enormous amount, surprisingly, of funding for biodiversity and climate resilience efforts and our sanitation biodiversity team is tiny. Um, and so I'd like to ask the CLO, C CLA and CAO to help figure out how to access funding, uh, particularly for our, our, uh, our pilot programs that are ready. So uh, I would still suggest that we include a grant writer and an additional staff person, but that also uh, we jump in quickly um, and have our city lobbyists and our our council members, particularly those with uh, legislative uh, connections and experience to jump on this money now. We've made a lot of progress with virtually no funding, um, partly out of uh, stubbornness of myself and others, but uh, this is a project that, that really merits significant funding and it's out there in, to a massive degree. So this is really the year to jump on this and, uh, and get the state's help on it.
Thank you, Mr. Kretz. It is an initiative whose time has come, clearly. Uh, appreciate that. So, uh, colleagues, I'd like uh, to now move to approve the Bureau of Sanitation report, including Mr. Kretz's recommendations, including <clears throat> my recommendation <clears throat> on the involvement of local indigenous communities in this conversation. <clears throat> Mr. Vino, if, if you could please uh, call the roll. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Council Member Mitchell Farrell? Aye. Council Member Mark Ridley Thomas? Aye, as amended. Council Member Paul Kuretz? Aye. Council Member Kevin DeLeon? Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian? Aye. The item is approved as amended, sir. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva. I would now like to go to item three. Mr. Prado, if you could please read item three. And I do understand there's an amendment you'd like to also read into the record. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, um, I'll include that as well. So number three, motion O'Farrell, Kokoria Martinez relative to the preparation of the memorandum for the record with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regarding the alternative delivery and roles and responsibilities for the Los Angeles River Ecosystem Restoration Project. And now, Mr. Chair, the technical amendment, I'll, I'll read what we'll, we should include in the moving clause. What we'd like to recommend you include in the moving clause of the motion. Uh, that it should read that the bureaus of engineering with the assistance of the city attorney and any other departments of bureaus as needed be authorized to draft execute and administer the memorandum of understanding with the u.s army corps of engineers regarding the alternative delivery and roles and responsibilities for the los angeles river ecosystem restoration project and uh, in addition um, to amend in the motion uh, the, replace any instances of memorandum for the record with memorandum of understanding and MFR replace that with MOU and that completes the amendment Mr. Chair. Thank you so much uh, uh, colleagues uh, everyone on this panel uh, is very well versed and very uh, uh, well credentialed in support of the Los Angeles River, its ecosystems, its, its uh, complete uh, revitalization. Uh, item three today is a presentation by LA Riverworks team on the next steps forward for the much awaited LA River Ecosystem Restoration and Recreation Project, uh, uh, also known as the very unenviable acronym LARERRR. Uh, we, we have had much discussion in committees and council starting in 2013 and finally adopting and approving the preferred alternative in 2016. Since then, a lot's been done. A lot of successes. We've acquired the crown jewel of the LA River, Taylor Yard G2, which is in reach six, has progressed substantially the city's commitment to further our goals and objectives of this study through acquisition and remediation and advanced planning. In other words, a $60 million investment. Two other reaches, three and eight, present similar expensive acquisition and remediation price tags and will demand an equally thoughtful approach to how the city leverages these acquisitions. That being said, I've asked the project team to present to us today a brief PowerPoint to better inform the efforts to enter into this project partnership to help develop a funding and financing plan to advance the goals and objectives of the project LARER. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Edward Belden, uh, Belden from LA Riverworks to go over the presentation. Good morning, Council Member and Chair Farrell. Pleasure to be Good here. Good morning. Good morning to all the council members on the committee. It's, uh, it's an awesome opportunity to present this project in light of the previous item where we were talking about diversity and how important that is to the city. And here is a great opportunity to talk about a project at hand the LA River Ecosystem Restoration Project, we're gonna be talking about alternative delivery as an option of how to really proceed with the project. Uh, the project area is 11 miles. It runs from roughly the Western edge of Griffith Park down to First Street in downtown LA. And we just talked about biodiversity. This is an ecologically rich area. We're in a Mediterranean ecosystem, it's very rare. LA County is one of the birdiest cities or birdiest counties in the country, but unfortunately we have lost 90% of our riparian habitat over the years. And this is a chance to bring that back, to actively 
restore hundreds of acres of wetlands and, and, and freshwater habitat. The Valley River still, though, does support over 140 different protected bird species along its course. The key goals of the project are to restore those lost ecosystems containing riparian habitat, marsh habitat, and increase that habitat connectivity. The area is located adjacent to Griffith Park, adjacent to the Legion Valley and the Legion Park. Uh, it has connections to the Arroyo Seco, which gets, you, gets uh, different species up to the San Gabriel Mountains and has numerous opportunities for the public to really come explore and access this open space and nature with the new trails that would be incorporated as well. This project was started back in 20, 2006 with a feasibility report that was finally finished in 2015. And as council member mentioned, was authorized or, or approved by, in 2016 by city council and authorized by Congress in 2016 as well. And since that time, we've been moving forward with helping to identify this project as now a pilot project and with uh, the, uh, the uh, delivery of G2 in terms of the, the actual purchase of that site earlier. Now this uh, new approach to delivery is different than the traditional relationship of a non-federal sponsor the city has with the Corps. Traditionally the Corps would deliver a project by do, completing the design and the construction of the project themselves. This is going to be a different program that I'll, I'll describe in a few moments here. But this was first started by the Corps in 2019 to accelerate delivery of their projects and pursue significant upfront federal funding for them as well and promotes risk sharing through project delivery by allowing this, the local sponsor to take on certain portions of the project itself. We're one of only three projects across the country, and that allows us to raise to the top of those projects that should go from authorized to appropriated and receive funding from the federal government themselves. Ultimately, this means a lot more flexibility for us as a city. Under this new approach, the city would take on responsibility for certain reaches and the Corps would take on responsibility for certain reaches as well. With the goal, of course, here to reduce the overall federal and non-federal costs, to maximize our ecosystem and restoration benefits of the project as a whole, and to make sure that the city has greater control over our cost spending for the design and construction of the elements. The city would be responsible for lands, easements, right-of-ways, relocations, and disposal areas, which we currently are obligated to provide. This, though, now gives us the opportunity to do the design and construction of reaches five and six, and then channel modifications for reach eight. The core would be responsible for design and construction of reaches one through four and reach seven, and providing the baseline studies and the technical allowances for all the reaches so that we understand what are the limits for the production, of, for the design and the construction of the project. When you look on a map here, reach five and six, that's roughly from Los Feliz Boulevard down to the five freeway. Those are the portions that the city would be responsible. Of course, that includes Taylor Yard, where the city's already started to take the lead and completed numerous reports, including the implementation feasibility report that was released this year. Reach eight, we would work on the in-stream portions first. The LATC and the piggyback yard would be put on uh, to discuss with the core at a later time. And then the core would look at reaches one through four and reach seven as well. And they would start with reach seven of course, the city has a chance to start with REACH 6 as well. These divisions and divided, the way the project was divided was based on the hydrologic and hydrology constraints of the system itself and the river, and that's why they were uh, divided up in this, this context. Overall, this project helps reduce the overall cost and risk to the, to the city and to the core. It reduces the auditing cost that the city would incur from the core and it helps allow us to look at even some additional financing opportunities, such as the WIFIA loan program, which is a federal opportunity that has lower interest rates uh, because they're, they're close to the 30-year treasury note. It also gives the city greater control and flexibility, allows us to lead on those reaches that I just described here, and a control of where our dollars are spent. Instead of giving that money to the core, we actually retain the cash that we're going to put towards the project to use it ourselves. There's even a chance for using alternative funding through mitigation credits for portions of the project area. Ultimately, this may help accelerate the delivery of the project where we can advance some of these, these goals by 2028, especially if the federal government comes through with federal appropriations this year. Traditional delivery would, would take about 26 years uh, for the core to finish this project. The motion outlines a, the development of an alternative delivery MOU which we've been drafting with the core here, and it outlines that the division of those reaches that we've discussed 
and it allows the city to evaluate how we would fund and finance this project over the full course. And we developed that by fall of 21, 2021. The commitments of funds would come later on as the project moves forward with a project partnership agreement with the Corps. And the city has a chance to look at that and in detail over the next year at least. Um, that's assuming that there's a construction new start, of course. Uh, the, the Corps must receive the construction new start, which we are targeting for 2022 by working with our federal lobbyists and our federal legislators. If they receive that, then we can start drafting that PPA, finalize the funding and financing agreement, work with the departments of the city, and then seek city council authorization for that final PPA, which we anticipated here as in December of 2022. And with that, that is the end of my uh, presentation. I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Edward, thank you so much. So, so clearly we've refined our approach and it's exciting because 2021 is not 2013 and we've learned so much and uh, I'll use a really bad metaphor, but there's been a lot of one, a lot of water to go into the bridge. Um, and so, so can you elaborate on, on why uh, we, I mean, you went into some detail, but um, what was kind of the trigger that said, hey, we need to refine this approach uh, so we can maximize everything, efficiency, the timeline, funding opportunities, et cetera? I think it's twofold. We've found that uh, the core traditionally is a, a slow agency. There's uh, reliant on federal appropriations that take time. This new approach that the uh, core offered, something that we jumped on right away, and I think it, it recognizes the city's willingness to be innovative by working with the core since we're one of three. Uh, we hope that that helps encourage additional federal appropriations for the project so it can move forward and then we can help see those cost escalation reductions. Uh, and it also allows us to just uh, take more greater control uh, that we know we've already started to take the lead on in Taylor Yard and we've shown that we have the capabilities and we know we have the capabilities to really implement this project now. Thank you and, and you mentioned the glacial pace of Army Corps. And I, I, I always have anxiety about the funding, especially it, to, to your knowledge, no sort of expectation of a local match has changed, correct? There's still a local match uh, likely component, no matter what we do with the LA River. Is that your understanding? Right, there's still a local match. This, uh, in other words, allows us to uh, use a portion of that local match that we would typically provide to the core to develop the project and deliver it, we'd be able to use it ourselves to deliver and design and develop that project portions. And so it's it's really time to accelerate the effort for a, a river enhanced infrastructure financing district for this reach. My, my anxiety is eased knowing that we haven't yet established it, but the report was done years ago and, and all of those elements are in place to make it happen. We just have to pull those triggers so that once all of this uh, table setting with the Army Corps for the, the, the projects that we're going to focus on so that we don't then lose time because we have no local match. So I would strongly advise uh, just for conversation's sake that we move collectively on getting that EIFD established and lay out exactly the steps that that will take or revisit them, uh, articulate them and just go for it um, because we'll be caught flat footed otherwise. Uh, and that's one incredible legacy we can all leave, and that is a permanent funding stream, or at least a 45-year funding stream, for to make good things happen uh, at the LA River. And with this biodiversity awareness, uh, it's I think more important than ever not to be caught flat-footed. So uh, with that, oh, go ahead. Uh, something to say, Edward? Uh, just to say that does sound like a really reasonable approach and and also looking we of course have as was brought up earlier uh, been pursuing other opportunities on a state level and any right. funding opportunity that might come to help support this project right well uh, so appreciate that and so you very thoughtfully extracted the learns from reach eight uh, which will allow the river improvements to move forward uh, while we can work on you know long term to discuss how to acquire other properties namely the piggyback uh, uh, property. Will we have the same opportunity with Reach 3, which is the Verdugo Wash area? Uh, where in the process do you see us codifying that in the same way as we have so skillfully, through your presentation here, carved out Reach 8 into phase uh, A and B? And you know, where where in the process can we can we hammer that out? Right. 
It's a good question. So we have the chance and opportunity through the development of this uh, funding and financing plan and then working with the core over you know, ideally the next year if they receive the federal appropriations to, to iron out those details. Um, and so we have the time to ensure that we can evaluate that from a financial perspective and, and what will work, what won't work, and how we can, uh, can divide that if we need to as well. And you, men you mentioned uh, congressional action. So, so can you outline the next steps or the timeline on the next infrastructure bill and how we can uh, I, I don't know, establish the pathway to get the federal and state dollars uh, committed? Sure. Uh, as much of a crystal ball as any of us might have. Uh, so our understanding is the infrastructure bill is, is moving forward and that uh, uh, we have had support that there's a, that this project maybe have a chance to be incorporated into that bill. Um, if that bill doesn't proceed, there's a, there is uh, some federal language right now that's been supported and thankful to Congressman Gomez and Senator Feinstein and and of course all the uh, federal legislators for supporting this project so far and state legislators and our council members as well for uh, writing letters of support as well for this project. Uh, but uh, we are targeting that at some level to have uh, construction new start funding. If not, it would be as uh, investigation funding for the account for at least to, to keep the project moving forward. Terrific. And, you know, once again, speaking of lobbying, um, we'll be returning to Washington, D.C. again. I certainly will by the winter time or early spring for sure. I'd like to make this a, a major, major uh, component of my visit uh, to the local congressional delegation and whatever other offices I can um, you know, push my way into. Uh, so, but we'll do a lot of lead up in, into that moment. Uh, so thank you so much, Edward, great presentation. It's refreshing and reassuring that we have a, a refined approach. Uh, so I really thank the, uh, river, your, the river team for your great work on this. Uh, so colleagues also, we are working on a resolution to introduce as early as next week uh, to seek further funding from our state and federal government partners uh, to work uh, with us to increase uh, these funding uh, streams. So we will set the table. Uh, we'll, we'll continue hammering away and we'll visit Washington. We'll, we'll do the lobbying officially from the city of LA so we can uh, keep these things going. Um, so I'm sure there are comments and questions. We'll start with uh, Mr. DeLeon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I may make a motion uh, to uh, uh, perhaps put you on the payroll so you can be our official lobbyist, both in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. I don't know what it says for our, our current folks who are on the payroll up in Sacramento, Washington, D.C. If they're doing a good enough job right now. Um, you got I, know it. That's up, I know that's up for debate, but uh, you may have to be our official lobbyist uh, in both uh, uh, state and, and nation's capital. Uh, but let, let me, uh, Edward, let me ask you a question. Where does the, um, and, and thank you for the presentation, um, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for um, facilitating uh, the presentations that we have been able to to uh, 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 witness so far. Um, where does the G2 parcel play into your presentation, uh, uh, Edward? Sure, so G2 is located in REACH 6. So that's uh, roughly between Guerrero Seco and the two freeway. And that's one of the areas the city would be able to take responsibility for the design and construction. And we obviously have had a, a great uh, direction already with the implementation feasibility report that was released this year uh, that outlines a few options, about three currently. And we already have some funding as well for the initial project elements. And then this would put us in the trajectory of then being able to reach those those final hurdles of finding funding for the rest of the project as well. And the G2, the real estate transaction is already finalized, it's already completed from Union Pacific? Right, the the city did purchase that back in uh, 2017. Okay. 2017, yes, right, that's right. So I got, I think it was a total of 50, was it 50? If I'm approximately- I think it was around 60 million. 60, okay, around 60. I know that, um, Actually, I just saw I saw the uh, the big giant uh, check. It's actually in my garage. I got had a bunch of stuff I was moving out. I saw I was able to secure twenty five, I think twenty or twenty five million dollars. Um, and the city 
you know, and I don't know if this is in Mitch's district or is the CD 13 or CD one. Uh, it's in, it's in one, uh, but I can throw a stone from. across the river from my yeah, district. It's, 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 to me, it's like one in the same, right? Oh yeah, it totally is. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. a, such a shared resource for all of Northeast LA. Yeah. CD 14, CD 13, CD one, you know, uh, the, the Troy got together. And, um, I know that the city used the Mikla card, uh, and we brought our resources together, both the city and the state. Um, and we're able to do the real estate acquisition. And now it's uh, to the point you're making, we've got to secure the resources now to actually develop it now um, for the, the ecosystem that it promises uh, for all of our uh, constituents throughout the city of LA, uh, not just Northeast, right, but throughout the city of LA, because obviously the LA River, but in particular, because it's, it's much more uh, primal uh, in the Northeast, CD13, CD1, CD14, uh, CD13 one, uh, a little more so, um, uh, for uh, uh, an incredible uh, uh, natural venue. But that is that is the G2, which plays into all of this, correctly? Right, right. And thank you, of course, for your support and past. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Edward. Thank you, Mr. DeLeo. It looks like we may not have any other uh, members on the queue. All right. So what I'd like to do uh, is approve this item as amended and uh, let's uh, get this motion introduced. Let's set the table and uh, get things uh, rolling along. So again, um, thank you. Thank you so uh, much for, for your great presentation, Edward and uh, the uh, River team. For, for your work on this. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, uh, Villanueva, please call the roll. Sorry, oh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Dorian. I'm no, so sorry oh, yes. to, to jump in late. Um, All right. But uh, just a quick question on the MOU with uh, the Army Corps. Will the terms of the final MOU be subject to City Council approval? I, would, so I believe... Oh yeah, wait, he's back. He's there. Okay. So the the motion is moving forward to City Council, I believe, next, and so uh, the final MOU would, I believe, just go before the City Council. Uh, okay, um, because in the in the moving clause, it, it provides um, that the Bureau of Engineering be authorized to draft, execute, and administer the memorandum for the record uh, with the Army Corps. So I just want to make sure that before there's any execution and administering, uh, the council has the final uh, the ability to say yes or no. Yeah, and we can send any drafts over that we have as well, of course, to the committee. Great, great, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, Mr. anyone else? Mr. Chair, this is Mike Apple from uh, other River yes. teams. Can I just also respond to the, the question from Council Member Pecorian, just to clarify? Okay, thank sure. you. Um, yeah, council member, the, uh, so the, the motion as it's written now, if it were to be uh, approved by this committee and then, uh, and then approved by full council, would give the Bureau of Engineering to finalize this, this MOU uh, as it's written without coming back for a, a second action. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that that's, that, it, that would be this action. Um, so if it was desired to then come back, I think we would need to, to handle that. But I just wanted to say that it's, um, the, this MOU, uh, being a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding, is um, not a uh, a commitment per se to to funding um, or expenditures. That will come in in the future in the form of a, part, a project partnership agreement, a PPA. Okay. And so this MOU is basically, as Edward explained very well, outlines the approach to this project given this new avenue of the the P three pilot program. Uh, but it, this action is meant to kind of fully encapsulate and not to come back for a second um, reading. Just want to clarify that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and uh, it's my understanding this needs to be approved before September, but it will definitely come back to council and we will lean in and yeah, for, for, the, uh, yeah, for, the, for the PPA portion. So um, we will have one last look regardless. Thank you. All right, Mr. Vino, please call the roll. Certainly, sir. Council member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Councilmember Mark Ridley Thomas. Aye. 
Council Member Mark Ridley Thomas. He he, uh, he had to leave. He had another obligation. Oh, okay, sir. Council Member Paul Coretz. Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Quicorian. Aye. The item is approved as amended, sir. Thank you so much. All right, we have two more items. They're very, very dense. I'm going to try to get them done in 30 minute segments each. So we'll give it our best. With that, uh, uh, Mr. Prado, if you could please read item eight. Early, Mr. Chair. Number eight. Motion O'Farrell Coretz Martinez relative to the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant wastewater spill, which occurred on July 11th. 2021 uh, ways to improve public notification protocols status of repairs and transition to 100 percent recycled water thank you mr Pedro. so uh, we all know that on july 11th a blockage at the hyperion water reclamation plant uh, had a significant uh, discharge uh, in uh, and sewage into uh, our into the pacific ocean uh, since finding out about this disaster, my office has been communicating with LA Sand to understand what caused the spill and what the department's next steps are to ensuring quick repairs and that this never happens again. Now, Tuesday, I was the Hyperion uh, treatment plant for a couple of hours and got a very comprehensive tour of the aftermath um, of the site on the ground. Uh, we probably walked for miles and saw so many things and had the whole entire system explained to us. I have a better understanding of what caused the sewage spill uh, and the plant became inundated with overwhelming quantities of unexpected debris, which literally blocked every one of its filtering screens. And you're gonna hear some details about that uh, very soon. Uh, and it goes without saying, but I'll say it, that we must continue to educate uh, our constituents about the importance of proper waste disposal, uh, continue to lobby for state and federal uh, policymakers uh, for this, whatever upgrades or whatever uh, uh, fixes to the system as it exists. Um, we know that along with uh, my office and Mr. Kretz, Mr. Krikori and, and Mr. Blumenfield, we put forward a motion encouraging uh, the passage of SB 343 put forward by Senator Allen, Assembly Bill 1201 put forward by Assemblymember Ting and uh, Assembly Bill 818 uh, put forward by Bloom to mitigate the effects of greenwashing, which is the practice of placing deceptive, exaggerated or misleading labels on products to make them appear environmentally friendly, such as adding do not flush to disposable wipes that shouldn't be disposed of by flush. And let me just tell you, I saw so-called so disposable wipes uh, in high numbers uh, floating through uh, the soon to be treated water on the filtration systems that they now have back up and running. Uh, there's all sorts of things that somehow end up flushed down toilets that sh should not be in the system. Uh, and uh, it's a real issue. It's important that we engage in dialogue and education and awareness to understand for everyday Angelinos everywhere to understand what caused this spill, the impact on our oceans, our beaches, our water quality, the steps we can take to mitigate future occurrences and emphasize the importance of updating on all public education and communication efforts. Uh, the motion before us today, furthermore, asks the Bureau of Sanitation to report on the status of repairs at Hyperion and its estimated completion date, as well as the steps the department is taking currently to alleviate community concerns. I understand that representatives from the department are present, including uh, our general manager, uh, Barbara Romero, who will kick it off, and there'll be a presentation of a, a PowerPoint uh, to all of us, uh, and a, a rundown uh, a committee uh, to the committee of the events that happened on July 11th uh, that caused this wastewater spill. What immediate steps the department took in response to the situation and how soon after it occurred did the sanitation, uh, Bureau of Sanitation know about the problem and what remediation steps are currently ongoing right now as we speak, the remediation steps that I observed on Tuesday and sort of the timeline 
to when it's expected to get back uh, to normal uh, functioning operations. So with that, Ms. Romero, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Chairman O'Farrow and committee members for this opportunity to address you today on this critical public health and safety and environmental issue. Sanitation takes our role as operators of the largest water reclamation plant in the country extremely seriously, as do we, as our role as environmental stewards and good neighbors. I need not remind you that this emergency resulted in massive flooding at our own facility and the subsequent discharge of millions of gallons of untreated sewage into the ocean. This has been a very challenging experience for us all involved. But let me begin our presentation today by saying that after three weeks of responding to this incident, I'm grateful and proud for the work our team has done. Work that was essential to prevent further destruction, mitigate the damage incurred, and now recover from the damage done. We believe we, believe we had made significant strides towards turning the corner and that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Pam, can you turn the slides, please? Well, let me begin our presentation today that after three weeks, uh, we believe, uh, sorry, today we'll provide more detail regarding the scope of the incident, how we responded immediately, and what we're continuing to do, and what we plan to do, not only in the future, but in the near future, from prevent this from ever happening again. We have identified some initial actions, like prompt notifications. Although we fulfilled our duty by notifying our regulators, as mandated by our permit, we can do more above and beyond and we'll strive to do that, especially now uh, with our recovery efforts and our monitoring results. Uh, we created a website um, on uh, an additional uh, page on our website. Our plant practices and operations have, uh, are analyzed regularly by our regulators, but we are working right now to hire a third party consultant to help assess our operations and how we can implement improvements in our controls and our processes so we can include and in that will include outside experts to work with us in that process including some of the nonprofits that uh, spoke today and we're also doing uh, a very a, a comprehensive internal assessment to ascertain what really caused the, the emergency um, internally and we're also bringing on consultants to help us to do that you really hear today the details of our presentation from my colleagues Tim and Tracy but please hear from me, from me first. My personal commitment that we're dedicated to being the best as we can be and that it will meet your expectations and the expectations of our residents and our neighbors um, moving forward. Thank you and now I'd like to introduce Tim DeFeda, our Hyperion Executive Plant Manager. Uh, thank you, Ms. Romero. Um, so I'm gonna start by uh, just giving an overview of the system that uh, conveys wastewater to Hyperion. So we serve a population of 4.7 million um, people that covers the areas from the city of Los Angeles into 29 contract agencies, including Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, uh, West Hollywood, and uh, San Fernando. Uh, we have 6,700 miles of sewers within the city of LA boundaries, and that's going enough to go to uh, from LA to New York about one and a half times. And the system receives 320 million gallons per day of uh, wastewater for treatment. And that's uh, more than two rose bowls uh, of wastewater that we get and have to process on a daily basis. On the Hyperion treatment side, uh, we, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the San Fernando Valley, we have our Tillman Water Reclamation Plant and Glendale Water Reclamation Park close to Griffith Park. And those uh, in turn process wastewater upstream but then the sludge from those come to the high period on treatment plant. So ne next slide, Pam, please. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with Hyperion, um, we have the Headworks facility, which is uh, in somewhat in the middle of the plant. And that Headworks facility um, takes all the conveyance system, waste from all the conveyance systems and brings it through five art falls into the plant. And so on that, uh, on July 11th, uh, we received a unusually large amount of debris that clogged all the bar screens. 
and uh, we'll go through the slides where you'll see the efforts that we made to try to um, contain all, all that flow within the plant once it, it began spilling out of the headworks building and then eventually how uh, we resulted in uh, discharge into the one mile out for uh, which goes into the Santa Monica Bay and then how we um, eventually ended the flooding at 430 in the morning. So uh, the pictures that you're looking at for, uh, for reference, uh, the top uh, picture is of the bar screens that were inundated on that Saturday afternoon. So that's what you see here. Uh, the bottom left corner is showing you what a bar screen looks like uh, when it's not inundated. Um, essentially, it's just a series of rakes uh, that clear up uh, uh, things like trash that come into the plant, and then uh, we we take those to the landfill. So usually we get about 20 tons a day of that material that comes in and that we have to take to the landfill. The picture on the right just shows you the flooding in that facility and how uh, dangerous it was and why we had to leave the facility in, uh, in order to ensure that employees were safe and not injured um, because we had a series of plates on the bottom that lifted up and uh, you would not know where the uh, openings were on the floor. Next slide, please, Pam. So this is just more debris again, just a, a more of a close up. So you see a lot of this stuff just, it looks ordinary pedestrian, but it's just a combination of all the amount that came at one time um, that rendered equipment that's designed to do a lot more than uh, what what happened on that day. So we have two bar, each bar screen, let me refrain, each bar screen is about a hundred and takes about 133 million gallons per day. And a Rose Bowl uh, water of water is 150 million gallons per day. So you can see tremendous capacity. We have eight of them, and usually we run about four to treat our average flow of 260 million gallons per day. On that day, we ran all eight of them, and all eight of them were disabled. Next slide, please. So uh, this just runs through a timeline of the prevention and mitigation efforts that began on the noon of um, July 11th and ended at 7 a.m. On, on the following day. So about 12 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, we began noticing a rise in water levels at the bar screen, and a lot of material began to come in and clog the bar screens. So staff continued to work towards uh, taking off the material from the bar screens. At about 3 p.m., uh, flooding began. So the, the flow was no longer contained uh, within the treatment process itself. So flooding began at the Headworks building and overflowed onto roads within the plant. And you will see those pictures. And so from the roads within the plant, uh, through the storm drain um, drains that are on the roadway, uh, water got into the storm drain system. And we continue to pump that back to minimize any kind of overflow uh, into the uh, one mile out fall. So around 7 p.m. after going through uh, from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., uh, the pumps could no longer keep with that volume of water that was running down the plant roadways in addition to the wastewater that was still coming. And so at that point was when we began overflow into the one mile outfall system, uh, which goes into the uh, Santa Monica Bay. So uh, the whole effort ended at uh, 4.30 uh, during low flow when we were able to open a bypass gate and, 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 and stop the flooding. So the pictures that you see up there is just showing you the bypass gate system. So the, the middle uh, portion that you see here is there's a, a giant piece of plate um, that sits in that slot where you, you see a crane holding a harness. And that, that slot is once you're able to get that uh, bar open, and the flow can come into the plant and bypass the bar screens. And so that uh, during the flooding, we were not able to get access to that piece of uh, a plate to pull it up and open a pathway for flow to stay within the process. So at 4.30 in the morning, we were able to intervene and go in there and, and do that. And so that uh, pretty much uh, put the flooding uh, to an end. Next slide, please. So this is the extent of the flooding, and you will see the picture. So for those of you that are familiar with Hyperion, on the north side is Imperial Highway, and we are across from LAX, and, and on the western half uh, side is Vista Del Mar. So half of the plant was uh, on the north side primarily was flooded, which is the um, blue and yellow areas. 
and that was all above ground. So 144 acres, uh, half of that flooded above ground. And then we'll go next slide, please, Pam. So and this is the flooding above ground. So you see from right from Imperial Highway um, all the way to uh, the intersection with um, Vista Del Mar uh, down south into the plant, all the roadways were flooded. And that's what you see in the picture. So the very left hand picture is we have uh, a series of tunnels that run from north to south within the plant. We call those our galleries. And that's where a lot of our sludge pumping and valves and electronics that run the plant are all below grade and you can go from north to south in the entire plant without coming up and the, the water went down into the subterranean areas and flooded all that which damaged substantially damaged the equipment and those are the pictures that you've seen on the left side and then on the right side you see the roadway and then the two last pictures that just shows you deposit of sludge all, all over the plant and so a lot of that material was deposited on site. Um, and in addition to the work that we had done before in installing catch basins and, and other uh, efforts that we are taking in the past, that ensured that uh, most of the material was re uh, retained on site. And, and even though we had, re regretfully, we had 17 million gallons go out, uh, but it could have been a lot much worse. And, and that's why the subsequent water quality data was much better than um, you would think when you see something like this. Next slide, please. So this is a, a site here uh, that um, we, we're doing construction for advanced water purification uh, facility. And, and so that shows you the extent of flooding. Uh, a giant lake was created on site there and uh, roughly about a million gallons of uh, on raw sewage got deposited at that uh, site. And so we had to pump all this back into the uh, treatment system. But it just, this is one of those illustrative pictures that shows you how, how, how um, devastating the flood was within our facility. Next slide, please, Pam. So uh, in terms of the emergency response measures that we took, um, I mentioned uh, from 3 to 7 p.m. we kept, and, and beyond that, we kept recirculating flows. So what you see in the middle with the, all the yellow inscription are all the connections to the one mile outfall. And that's essentially our storm drain system. So we designed it in such a way that when a storm comes, we pump the storm water back into the process and it combines with the process flow, the wastewater that is coming and we treat all that water. But you don't want excess storm water also to get into the system because then now that reduces your treatment capability. So beyond a certain level, uh, the storm water can go out. So in this case, we kept using those pumps um, since the water drained into the storm drain system. And that's what we did for uh, the, the next half from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. in order to contain everything on site. The two pictures that you see on the bottom uh, represent the catch basin and the screens that we had installed. And so that shows you how the, the catch basin prevented materials from getting into the ocean. And so that's why in this event, you never saw any kind of floatable materials in the ocean because all that was uh, retained on site. Next slide, please. So again, more uh, pictures in terms of uh, assessment and, and the response that we took uh, for, from 7 a.m. on the 12th through uh, 4.30 p.m. On, on the 12th. So after the flooding was over, uh, we went now into the facilities to look at what we had in place. So as you can imagine, um, the headworks, um, we were able to bring two bar screens back online immediately, uh, but a lot of the sludge pumping uh, within the plant was all rendered uh, inoperable because of all the flooding and that took place in all the underground galleries. So the pictures that you've seen is our effluent pumping plant, and that's uh, two stories worth of water filled. And so a lot of pumps and everything submerged in there. So we had to drain all that water out of those facilities and then begin the repairs of equipment. Similar uh, truck loading facilities where we take our biosolids uh, for beneficial use on our farm uh, was all uh, just devastated. So we, again, had to begin the repairs of that facility. And that's like the terminus point. Uh, once you have a log jam at that terminus point, then everything backs up within the facility in terms of being able to get solids out. And so that took a while also for the repairs there. And that facility right now is running on emergency generators, but we're able to get it uh, up and running. Next slide, please, Pam. So uh, 
this just uh, a graphical representation of all that flooding underground and all the areas that were impacted. So pretty much from north to south in the plant, um, the water made its way through all the underground galleries and just kept flowing and um, up to modern um, waist height in some cases. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the recovery process, so the uh, the first picture you see on the right hand side is that is the two story building water of water and it's showing you the giant pumps that do uh, help us um, when we have very um, intense rain storms or very high flows that pump water out the five mile outfall. So typically we go out by gravity as we're doing right now. But when we have uh, giant rain storms coming, um, those pumps come on. So those pumps were submerged in, in, in that two stories worth of water that you see. So by on the 16th, uh, we had all eight bath screens back online. Um, the first sludge pumps began to work on the 16th, but not substantial. And so between the 29th and the 31st were when, was when we began to really uh, get um, the sludge pumping uh, on track. And so, um, and that's, a lot of the problems or the series of problems that you, you've had associated with this flooding event that is still occurring has to do with our inability to um, get sludge out of the plant. Next slide, please. So um, on, on the very next morning, we began ocean monitoring right away at about nine o'clock in the morning, uh, monitoring uh, locations all the way from Redondo Beach to Santa Monica and up to our one mile and five mile outfalls and all uh, the bacteria levels were below um, uh, below uh, normal levels uh, for all the days that we monitored during that event. And so that speaks again to uh, the effort that was made um, and the investments made in past and that if such an event occurred, we could retain a, um, a lot of the material that would typically end up into the ocean on site. Next slide, please. So uh, the process as part of the recovery effort, a lot of reconstruction is ongoing. Um, so we are uh, building a lot of bypasses around places. As you can imagine, most of the flooding uh, impacted pumps, uh, valves, electronic systems. Um, for, we have hundreds and hundreds of pumps. Um, for such a large system, and we have large, huge, large diameter pipes. And a lot of the valves for those pipes all work with uh, electronics. And so once the electronics is dead, then you can open a valve and then the pump is all submerged. So the pump has to be taken apart and rebuilt. And we're doing a lot of those. But in order to be able to continue the sludge pumping and we know the effect on, our, on the environment and on our neighbors, uh, we undertook building a lot of bypasses to get around um, the, the, the log jam or, or the challenges that we have uh, in order to keep moving in sludge uh, around and keep treating the, uh, the wastewater. Next slide, please. So these are just more reconstruction pictures. Again, new pumps, new valves, um, all that taking place uh, ultimately um, to be able to uh, move sludge around. So for it took us almost three weeks. So you can imagine uh, 4 million people um, sending their solids to us. Um, we couldn't uh, release stuff into the ocean and, and we couldn't have uh, material back into people's homes. So. We held that material over the course of three weeks and, 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 and built a lot of bypasses and a lot of uh, ways uh, to be able to stay in operation. And so finally, uh, we are on the right track. The sludge pumping has begun and a lot of the monitoring number, but from the air quality standpoint of view and the water quality standpoint of view, uh, we only get uh, better as we go forward. So in terms of one of the parts of the motion was how many of the equipment is uh, online, uh, uh, how's the repairs going on. So we identified about 77 critical equipment that we need uh, to run. We have a lot of redundancies built into our system. So total, when you look at the total number of redundancies, we said, I, you know, the best situation is having 199, 129 of those critical equipment running. But you know, ideally, we usually have 77 of, about those, of those running. And so right now, in terms of repairs, we have 53 of those running. Those, the 53 that we have running right now out of the 77 is enough for us to do what we need to do because we've built a lot of bypasses and things uh, to move forward. So I want to give you that assurance that as we continue to work and do repairs, uh, what we've had, we've put in place up until now um, is enough to, 
to get us to the finish line. Next slide, please. So yeah, just more, this is just illustrative again of, uh, of the work that was done by us and contractors of all the hard work to retain uh, material within the system and just keep the treatment going on. So we, we brought uh, emergency pumps on site, uh, we brought uh, piping to build new, new, new lines to just move uh, material around and, and just keep the plant going. So um, we'll be happy to take um, the rest members of the community, that, uh, the committee that want to come visit us uh, uh, to take you around to show you uh, what was done in, in terms of uh, getting the plant moving and running. Next slide, please, Pam. So um, one of the uh, main points we wanted to get across is we do have robust regulatory oversight over the plant. So uh, from a discharge standpoint of view, we have a permit, uh, a discharge permit is issued by both the EPA and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And so that's a very robust system there in terms of having oversight and the EPA and the Regional Board are already involved in terms of investigation as to what happened and trying to get to the bottom of it. So we are working with them and we have providing uh, the necessary uh, data for them. In addition to that, we have AQMD on the air quality side, and that's looking over our shoulders, the health department, um, OSHA, so you name it, different uh, National Ocean Atmospheric Agency, everybody's involved here. And so that with that robust oversight, and, and as was mentioned, that we ourselves are going to be embarking on a third party review to look at things. We believe that with all that, all that effort there, um, we can get to the bottom of this and, and get to a better outcome at the end. So next Tim, slide. Yes. Tim, real quick, I'm, I'm leaning in for, for a second here. Can you... Um, so so some housekeeping as well and then you'll continue um we're going to approve the motion after we hear some comments from the members uh it'll go to council then it'll come back to committee uh i'm going to shorten my questions i had six of them i'm going to shorten them to one uh and i'm going to ask you uh tim if you'll just go to next steps skip the next several slides and go right to next steps uh, because I'm going to also request a presentation to the full council when it does go to council. Uh, so um, what's really crucial is that we, we get this going and then we hear the next item uh, because we're going to lose quorum at one o'clock sharp. We're going to lose quorum entirely because of other obligations. So uh, colleagues, I, I ask your indulgence on this uh, and we'll get to Mr. Kretz and Mr. Krikorian for your questions. But Tim, if you just go right to next steps and end the presentation for now, and then we'll hear the whole presentation with the full council. Please, please, sir, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So in, t in terms of next steps, uh, we're gonna review our plan protocols and procedures. Uh, we're doing investigation on our conveyor system, the 6,700 miles of uh, sewers that I mentioned to try to ascertain where the material came from. Uh, as you mentioned, education and outreach is a key component. How, how do we work towards reducing those 20 tons of material that ends up in the landfill on a, on a daily basis. Um, so in terms of facility process and improvement, um, as we mentioned, the bypass gate was key to solving the problem, but we never got to it on time before the flooding. So that's something that we're going to look at in terms of uh, how we uh, improve things such that the bypass gate serves that function in a timely manner. Um, the flooding was the biggest body blow to us, so we're going to look at how we seal all the doors, outside facing doors, so that that water doesn't get into the subterranean system and damage equipment in the future. And then multiple ways to reroute flows within the plant such that we're not depending on one facility such as the headworks uh, when flooding is occurring. And we'll continue to work with uh, AQMD, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to schedule a meeting with them next week to just go over the monitoring and they've linked on their website with our website too so all the monitoring that they're doing in neighboring communities are live on their website right now and the data does look good at this point yeah. thank you thank you tim uh I, i've narrowed this down uh to one question i think this is of mo utmost importance to all parties concerned who are listening in the residents of los angeles beach goers etc um so how long do you believe that the discharges will continue uh, at the state they're in? And when will the repairs be complete? Estimation, I won't quote you here, but estimated repairs to be complete, the discharges return back to normal, fully, fully reclaimed, filtered, et cetera. Uh, 
when can we expect a return to normal functioning operations? I would say uh, no later than the end of the month. Okay, no later than the end of the month. And yeah, but we, we are striving to do it better. So within, I would say, a window of between two weeks to the end of the month. Thank you for that. All right, Mr. Kretz, let's do a, a quick round of questions because we've got to get to the next item. I don't want to get it, give it short shrift. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll try to do that, although I have some key questions I think we really have to ask. Uh, okay, but but if if we do, I'm going to have to postpone uh, the the next item and, and do a special meeting on it. There's no other way around it because you and Mr. Corian both have to leave. Like I said, we're, this is going to go to the full council, and I'm going to request a full presentation. But but go right ahead. Okay. For, first question is, uh, well, first I want to commend the amazing work of the actual workers on site who, as I understand it, uh, prevented us from completely losing the Hyperion plant. Um, if that had happened, or if we ever do lose Hyperion completely, what happens to our sewer water? Do we become the Aliso Canyon of sewage and just have this the entirety of our sewage of Los Angeles pouring out for months? Or do we have backup protocols that help us get through it? And what can we do to, to uh, improve those backup protocols. So because Hyperion is at the end of the line, we do have our Tillman and uh, Los Angeles Glendale plants up in, in, in the valley and, and by uh, Griffith Park. So they do help in terms of relieving the system, but the vast majority of this system um, from the city and from contract agencies comes to Hyperion. So and that's why staff fought so hard to ensure that the facility was uh, stayed online in order to prevent 260 million gallons a day of sewage going either into the ocean or back in into people's homes. Uh, those were un untenable things for us. And so uh, we'll continue to work to show up the plant such that we never find ourselves in such a situation um, going forward in the future. But, but what would have happened if the plant had shut down completely? So you would have could sewage. Have happened. Uh, sewage backing into homes, onto streets, and on finding the path all the way uh, into the ocean or, or the low-lying spots. Yeah, clearly a, a, a complete disaster, so we have to figure out ways to guarantee that can't happen. Um, is there a way for us in the future to figure out how to more quickly clear these screens if uh, we should have this kind of a, an unusual debris situation? So that's the assessment that we, uh, as part of the assessment that we're going to do, we're going to bring the manufacturer of the screens in um, because those screens are just two years old to see whether we need to upsize uh, the motors that run them, for example. But a key point is also the fact the bypass gate was essentially in ending it. And so we know that we could set thresholds in such a way that we activate the bypass gates before we get to a flooding situation. It was, uh, we tried to uh, get to it after the flooding began, but it was too, it was quick. It was too quick for us to get to it before the flooding began and it became dangerous to be in the building. So when it was safe enough to go in, that's when we opened the bypass gate. So we've learned from that experience and we will set thresholds that allow us to be able to activate it much sooner. And uh, what's the situation as far as uh, insurance surrounding Hyperion? Um, how are the repair costs being covered? What's the impact uh, on our rate payers? So in terms of repair costs, uh, that will largely be coming from our sewer construction and maintenance um, um, fund. Um, but we do have uh, also the city is self-insured and has an insurance company and they've been in contact with us. And so now we begin um, the, the process of, of, of uh, consulting with them to see what it is that the insurance will cover versus um, and knowing what, what is not, uh, um, that the insurance will not cover. But that, that contact has uh, just been made this week by the insurance company and we have to uh, begin that process of seeing how, how working things out, yeah. Great, and uh, I know we have a longer term project uh, operation next to uh, try to achieve 100% recycled water. What's the possibility of, while we're making these repairs, uh, targeting some of them so that uh, they can build towards that rather than just replacing everything and then having to completely rebuild it for the next project? 
Is there any way to take advantage of that now and do some of our rebuilding in a way that helps get us to the next project? Yeah, we certainly will do that. That's a great idea. So first of all, we, we, we're working towards trying to repair things so that we don't have to replace. So that will minimize the cost going forward. Um, we also looking at the nexus between Operation Next 1 for uh, Hyperion 20, 2035 and Operation Next. That will uh, modify the plan significantly in terms of uh, a lot of the areas that are of concern right now. The, the technology that will deploy in the future will totally replace all those uh, areas of concern. But things, for example, such as um, equalization basins, which are storage basins that we're going to need for uh, Hyperion 2035 Operation Next, we can also use those as uh, storage basins in the in the, in the event of an overflow. So there are a lot of nexus that we see uh, uh, that we can factor in as we do the planning and as we do the design for um, Operation Next going for uh, Hyperion 2035 going forward. Great. One last question. Super um, quick, sir. Super I'll try quick. to make as quick as I can. I think it's also important. Uh, there was a, a story about a man who got killed climbing out of a manhole cover in Panorama City a few weeks ago. And I'm wondering if it might even be possible that some people during this dry period have moved into the sewers and that could be part of uh, the debris that uh, we're, we're finding in the filters. Could people be living there? Could people be uh, dumping construction debris in there? Have we looked at whether we're, we're getting some uh, unexpected sources of debris that we need to identify and prevent in the future? Councilman Koretz, I'll take that question. Tracy Menemidi, Chief Operating Officer, LA Sanitation and Environment. Um, as part of this whole uh, recovery, we have begun an assessment into our wastewater conveyance system. So we're going to be looking um, both by looking at flow gauges as well as doing visuals with uh, cameras into our maintenance holes um, and hiring a, a third party expert on um, sewers. So that assessment is, is going to give us some information as to what could have caused the problems in the sewer uh, conveyance system. Um, we, we expect a report in the next uh, two to three months on that, but we're going to be focusing on certain areas that uh, potentially certain structures in the sewer system um, that could have debris uh, buildup and cause this big deluge at Hyperion. Um, We'll be looking to see at some of our maintenance holes if there was any access by outsiders that could um, have led to debris in our sewer collection system. Um, and going through a lot of uh, CCTV work and camera work within the sewers itself to see if we can see evidence of debris um, that was dislodged um, and hung up at certain places in our collection system. So that's definitely something that we will be reporting back on to the committee and to council. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kretz. Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the interest of time, I'm going to reserve all my questions for, for council, but I do want to just make one quick comment. And, and that is what I just heard uh, from sanitation is really a story about the heroism of our city employees uh, under extraordinary catastrophic circumstances. Our city employees went in in one of the world's largest water reclamation plants that operates 24 hours a day, 365 days a year without ever stopping. Uh, our city employees saved the Pacific Ocean and the city from a much more catastrophic result. And I just wanna emphasize that. And that further, the source of this problem was not some failure by employees. It was not some failure of, of infrastructure. It was people doing stupid, irresponsible things. It was people doing irresponsible things and then expecting mommy government to clean up after them. Litter in the streets, illegally dumped construction materials, things being flushed down the toilet that everybody knows shouldn't be flushed down the toilet. So I hope that part of this investigation is also gonna be stopping our public from doing stupid things and then expecting government to try to fix it for them. 
um, we, we just have to be as blunt about this as we can. Because in a city of this size, we cannot have the taxpayers continuing to invest billions of dollars in new infrastructure and then having that entire process be ruined by irresponsible people who are dumping things down manhole covers, dumping things in the street, dumping things down their toilets. Enough already. So that's my comment. I'll save my questions for later. Thank you, Mr. Here, 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 Mr. Krikorian, and not to mention uh, employees at the plant risking their lives to stop this. It's a miracle there weren't severe injuries. Their lives, their health, their well-being. Uh, it's, it, it is a disaster of, of, uh, that could have been totally avoidable. So I also look forward to this, and we'll bring it to council. We'll approve this for now. We'll ask more questions. Uh, great questions, colleagues. Thank you so much, Mr. Villanova. Could you please, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. De Leon, real quick. Thank you. Um, am, I, am I on? You're on. Yeah, thank you for, for the conference about that. Be very quick, just real quick. We know this, this charge is very concerning. It's not good for the residents near the beach. And all the Angelinos who are seeking out our beach fronts escape the hate, the heat, or the ecosystems of the, the, the coast. Just a couple of questions real quick. With this unfortunate event happening in the summertime when we get little rain, will we will we be prepared for the rainy season when the amount of water flowing in the facility actually doubles? So that question there, and I know that there's numerous upgrades that you talked about happening to the facility to better serve Angelinos and keep up with our goal of maintaining the ecosystems around the plant. So are, are there any other infrastructure updates we need to look at to ensure that it can continue to serve our Auckland city? Those are the only questions I have right there. So, uh, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, we will be ready for uh, the raining season. Uh, we do have a, a robust system in place. Uh, we, we know there are some there's some work to do to show up that system. Uh, and this event was a teachable moment for us in terms of looking at where the vulnerabilities are and how we can um, uh, plug those holes. And so I am quite confident that we will, as we move forward and we address those issues, um, get all the pumps online, um, we have more than enough capacity to handle the flows uh, during a uh, rainy season. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Tim, uh, and colleagues. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeLeon, Did you have any further? Yeah, there was a second. The second question was just a really brief question: was the, the, the updates on the infrastructure? So uh, we 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 have a robust capital improvement program in LA Sanitation, um, about two hundred and fifty to three hundred million dollars worth. Uh, we go through comprehensive reviews to identify areas on the infrastructure uh, that needs to be improved. Um, and then as we work towards water recycling, uh, more, uh, more projects will come along the line to show up that infrastructure. But there is a, a system to identify uh, things that are in need of repairs, uh, uh, where vulnerabilities are, and, and then fund those. Um, as, as was mentioned also, the committee so with the, uh, with the, um, the the contacts that the committee has with uh, various agencies on the federal and state level, uh, anything that uh, the members of the council can do to bring more dollars towards helping us shove up infrastructure, even though we have funding, but it's never enough. So uh, that's, that would be something that the council can definitely help us on in terms of um, building resiliency into the system. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think that uh, I think that covers uh, this this item. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Buenova, if you could please uh, call the roll. Certainly, sir. Council Member Mitchell Farrell. Aye. Um, Council Member Mark Lee Thomas is not here anymore. I think. Council Member Paul Coretz. Aye. Council Member Kevin De Leon. Aye. Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. The item is approved, sir. Thank you. And colleagues, I want to hear from you. Is, is there a hard out at 1 o'clock? Uh, are, we, are we definitely going to lose quorum at 1 o'clock, or can we go to 1.15? Uh, Mr. Um, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, both Mr. Yes, Kretz sir. and I are expected in EERC, which begins at uh, one o'clock. Uh, so I, I think it would be, uh, I think it would be important that we both be in that meeting at one o'clock. I, I agree completely. And I do not want to give LA 100 short shrift. Uh, I'm hopeful that everyone can be available two weeks from today for a special hearing on a single issue item, LA It's imperative that this council give instructions uh, to the department, uh, considering all that's at stake with climate uh, change uh, and our, our priorities uh, related to that. Uh, with the instructions, uh, I gotta so go that, 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 that's what I'm. Over again. Yeah, that's what I'm going to push for, is that we have a standalone special meeting on LA 100. A lot of work has been done in advance of getting this calendar today. The advocates are very engaged. Uh, the Department of Water and Power is very engaged. Our labor partners within IBEW are very engaged. So. We really want to bring this together and we will okay, make else. adequate time for that to happen in a couple of weeks. So we'll continue the item and it will have a special hearing. On the Thank you for uh, everyone's uh, patience. Mr. DeLeon, you're not on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, but you guys can hear my conversation if you'd like to. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's, just, just. it's infinitely interesting, <laughs> sir, but, but we're good. All right, so we'll continue the item if there are no objections. Uh, and seeing as there are no objections, that'll be the order. And we will have a standalone meeting on this, what is arguably the most important issue of the day. Uh, uh, Mr. Vinueva, do we have any other business before us? The desk is clear, sir. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for your patience. And callers and advocates, uh, rest assured, uh, we will hear a full, robust conversation on LA 100 with all of its uh, components. Thank you so much. Uh, this meeting is adjourned.